Stand down. Stand up versus Crown Prosecution Service. For the reason we set out in the judgment which I now hand down, is that this appeal is dismissed. So can I just conclude Article 8 with our response to, yes. the, uh, with our response to the um, Secretary of State's argument by reference to M uh, my Lord's judgment in MS India. <coughs> we say uh, that, that the quotation of MS India in, in the respondent's skeletal joint skeleton argument is uh, incomplete and um, is not, is, the citation is not of assistance when one understands the context of MS India in the judgment um, and the observations of my Lord in, in my Lord's judgment. So can we turn up MS India briefly? That's tab 41. my Lord, just to read the entirety of that paragraph. Yes, but even before we read that, perhaps this is what you're about to say. It's a very different kind of case, because it's someone who had leave to remain and was clearly going to have leave to remain. That's what I was about to come on. Okay, the, first, the first point of call is to read the entirety of the paragraph right. because, because I'm entitled to point out that when you look at the, the rest of paragraph 124 after the quoted text, it's actually acknowledged that our yeah. was engaged even in that case. Yes. Um, and the reason... Uh, and well, let, let's just read... Sorry, it's my fault for interrupting. Let's just read the whole thing and then, then, then you can make your point. of the circumstances referred to in paragraph 102 of the judgment, which I won't ask my Lord to turn to now, but essentially there were implications in terms of private life by virtue of conditions that would be attached to the discretionary grant of leave that would uh, remain in effect if ILR was not granted. And it was accepted by the parties and apparently by the court in that case that that was enough to engage our claim. The instant case appeals are a fortiori for the reasons I discussed before. Um, <coughs> and it's important to note that uh, as my Lord, Lord Justice Sunday Hill has pointed out to me, this was a case where um, ILR was refused, but in circumstances where the um, applicant for ILR were never going to be removed and had discretionary leave to remain. Uh, and more generally, the observations at paragraph 124 can't lay down a general rule that a refusal of ILR uh, does not engage our collate. That, that is simply not a tenable reading of paragraph 124 and, and is wrong in principle. Um, so my Lord's... Um, the Secretary of State's response to the Article 8 argument is, is simply the reasons I developed before lunch and for the reasons I've just given in terms of MS India. It is simply um, misconceived and, 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 uh, and, and so we, we say that the Article 8 argument is, is frankly unassailable. Turning then to the Wensbury uh, principles and their application in this case, <coughs> the first point is that this context is one where a heightened standard of Wensbury review is appropriate. And I'm sure my Lords will need no persuasion of the proposition that Wensbury is intrinsically sensitive to context. And I'll just give you the reference to the Supreme Court's decision in Kennedy at paragraphs 51 and 55 of Lord Mance's judgment in that case uh, to make that good. So that's at tab 25, page 591 to 594. And we say that an intense form of Wensbury review is appropriate because of two factors. Firstly, there's an, allega an, an allegation of dishonesty, which has historically been treated as a special form of allegation by these courts. 
And you see that in Lord Justice Richard's judgment in Geary, for example, at paragraph 32, which I gave a reference to before lunch, uh, where Lord Justice <coughs> Richards accepted my learned friend Mr. Malik's submission, who then appeared on behalf of Mr. Geary, um, that a allegation of dishonesty had to be reviewed um, essentially against a heightened standard, very carefully was the language he used. We submit it's right as a matter of principle that the same approach apply here. And secondly, because of the consequences uh, that would befall uh, appellants such as Mr. Balaji Gary, applicants, sorry, such as Mr. Balaji Gary, um, of, of the use of 3225 to end leave to remain. And I've covered that already in my submissions. Um, but is the standard of review still irrationality? It has to be Wensbury as a matter of principle because we accept that we're not in the territory of precedent fact. Mm. But of course, that's only insofar as human rights issues are not engaged. If, 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 if my principal argument, which is Article yes. 8 engaged, right, is then of course, it, it's proportionality and fact-finding for the reasons I've developed yes. earlier. But, but we accept that there's no argument for precedent fact here as a matter of principle, because the Secretary of State's decision-making power depends on a broad discretion under Section 3.1 of the 1971 Act, albeit it's informed by the rules. And Geary is binding authority, we would accept to that effect in any event. Um, but what does a heightened scrutiny of review, a heightened scrutiny standard of review mean in this context? Well, we submit that um, Lord Justice Carnworth, as he, as he then was, was, gave helpful guidance on the meaning of anxious scrutiny review or heightened scrutiny review in the YH Iraq case, uh, which is at tab 52, um, at paragraph 24 of his judgment, page 1601 of the authorities bundle. Uh, and what I extract from that passage. Which, which paragraph, sorry, paragraph. Paragraph 24, my lord. Yep. It, it was a case involving a challenge to a section 94 certificate. It was accepted that the standard of review was anxious scrutiny, and, and Lord Justice Underhill explained what anxious scrutiny would be. Uh, Lord Justice Calm was, yeah. I think. I'm, I'm, I'm it would be so beyond sorry. me to explain what anxious scrutiny is. I'm so sorry, I was looking at my lord. Um, yes, no, Lord Justice <coughs> Carnworth, as he then was, it, it explained what anxious scrutiny means. And he said essentially two things. Firstly, it means that the Secretary of State has a burden of justification. And secondly, that the reasoning used in support of the decision had to show that every factor that might help the applicant had been properly taken into account. And in my submission, the same approach should be applied here. Is that the last word on anxious scrutiny? I know that Lord Sumption has spoken about it somewhat sceptically, extrajudicially, yes. but I don't know whether it's been revisited recently I'm, I'm not aware in the Supreme Court. I'm not aware of that. I mean, we, we, whatever label you use, there's a heightened scrutiny standard of review, applying the um, sliding scale of intensity of when it's been reviewed that we now know is applicable following Kennedy. <coughs> I, I, I don't... I mean, anxious scrutiny is as good a label as any, if you like, because the courts have at least considered what anxious scrutiny means in, in previous case law, in, in particular YH Iraq. But, but I certainly wouldn't object if my lord wanted to use a different label. And we, we use the expression heightened scrutiny. Mm. Um, so, so we say that w whatever label one uses, the intensity of Wensbury review in this case is right at the extreme end of the level of intensity that Wensbury requires because of the two factors I've indicated, dishonesty and consequence. You, you, you said something about burden, <coughs> and I may have misunderstood. Um, I'm sorry, Lord, I didn't hear you, you. You used the word burden. Right. A moment ago, but the, you said the burden of justification on the Secretary of State. Do, do you mean that there's a, there's a burden of proof if, if, if the Secretary of State is asserting dishonesty, then it's for him to prove it? Well, in, in my submission, a burden of proof is only properly so called is only appropriate when look when looking at principles of objective law, essentially the law of evidence, when it comes to courts and tribunals exercising a, a particular jurisdiction to resolve disputes. Mm. In the administrative law context, therefore, the, the language of burden of proof is, is inapposite. But, so, so what I mean is that the Secretary of State comes to a judicial review court or tribunal and has to satisfy it that the decision was taken in accordance with um, the law and, well, and uh, when... Uh, uh, as I understood it, you were paraphrasing, um, without taking us to, with, in principle I applaud, um, what Lord Justice Carnworth said in YH, but I think this is perhaps sufficiently important that we ought to look at it. So if we can turn up tab 15, it's page 1601. <coughs> you can stop the wrong tab, which tab is it? 
62 of Zoe. Page 1601, paragraph 4, you see the line marking. So, so implicit in the requirement that the decision letter set out every factor which could help a minor. So sorry. Um, what, what, were, you, were, you, were you taking us to YH? Yes, it's YH behind tab 50. Yes, I'm there. Were you, were you then reading something? Paragraph 24. And it's the, uh, if you, it, it's the passage four lines down from the beginning of the paragraph. However, it has by you section. All right, thank you. There's nothing there about uh, burden. I would accept that in terms of the express language used, but in my submission, the only the only one, way one can understand what Lord Justice, Lord Justice Carmel was then was he's saying here is that the Secretary of State has to put forward adequate reasoning that shows that every single factor that would help the migrant has been properly taken into account. And so that is a reflection of a broader point, which is that the Secretary of State has a burden of justification. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I, I understand how you use the word justification there. It's not a burden of proof. The expression aims to scrutiny is it, not only on uninformative, but if this passage is right, positively unhelpful. Uh, Amca scrutiny suggests, or, or heightened scrutiny, suggests that uh, in some decisions, uh, the court or, or whoever are considering the challenge of the administrative decision uh, can, can, can do it without, with, with, with less than proper care, which is simply not right. Mm. What, what um, Lord Justice Palmer focused upon is. Um, the, the reasons given for the decision, which shows expressly that you have done what you ought to do, and that is paid in favour, uh, paid in, in the applicant's favour, uh, all, all of those matters which you exactly. properly should have done. That's, that's right. That, that's why I say, my Lord, that, that really what Lord Justice Carmouth was saying is, in an anxious scrutiny context, there's a burden <coughs> of justification on the, on the, on the public body. And, and that's discharged by showing that the reasoning is such as to demonstrate, beyond any doubt, if you like, that all that the right approach is there. But, but all this just shows what a mess we got into in all this, because yeah. that's not really about intensity of review. No. That's about showing your workings to an unusual degree. <coughs> yes. It's really a completely separate point. And although both nobody likes an anxious, anxious scrutiny, and I don't think anyone likes the same reason like heightened scrutiny, Nevertheless, if we have got into the habit, as we appear to have, of talking about different levels of intensity of review, while at the same time using the label rationality, um, some sort of concept of, of, of looking harder at the issue, is what intensity of review seems to mean, is still there. And it's not just about, it's not just about showing your reasoning. I... Mean, I, I well, I, you can tell from what I'm saying. I, I have never, not quite understood where the law has ended up on this. Yes. And I'm not expecting an essay from you, although if you could enlighten me, I'd be delighted. But I just want to make sure we have the latest authorities on this so that we can deal with it as best we can. And Y.H. Iraq is obviously a little little while ago, I and mean, it's quite a short passage, yes. although it is obviously important because it's from Lord Carnworth, who's very <coughs> in this area. There's Kennedy, I know. Um, you've also got Fan in, in, in bundle too, but that simply applies. That uh, just applies Kennedy. I mean, if, if, yeah. if we can look at Kennedy if it will assist my Lord, but basically, I mean, one of the points that Lord Mans made in Kennedy is that you can review a dispute of fact against Wayne Street, and that's been acknowledged. So this, I would submit, is one of those cases which, where, where you, it, it may be possible for, 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 the, for the tribunal um, in judicial review to look at a dispute of fact in a way that perhaps in another less intense application context of, of Wayne Street, the court would be reluctant but of course, how that works in practice is very difficult because um, Wensbury um, is not an obviously, it, 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 the application of Wensbury to hard edge questions like disputes of fact is not easy. Um, no, quite. Um, well, I mean, I, it's a genuinely difficult area. I'm not encouraging you to say more. I just want to make 
sure that we had you given us as, um, the right authorities, and you clearly have. And we'll have to see where it goes. I mean, I, as I say, all I can add is that as the fact, the, the, the point that a, a finding of fact is an issue is not dispositive against a, an applicant for judicial review where a more intent form of when to be is appropriate, and this is the point Lord Max makes. So, so I make that <coughs> in this yeah. context too. Um, I should say, if it assists, that I think Professor Paul Craig has endorsed. Um, uh, Lord Justice Carmer's observations of paragraph 24 of YH is providing some context to this um, otherwise quite uninformative concept. That's in that and LQR. It's, the, that LQR. It's in the Cambridge Law. Oh, Court, is it? But I may be wrong. Well, I, I can I'm provide that if that would assist. But Lord, and Lord Sumption has said a similar thing about um, anxious scrutiny being a very uninformative expression and acknowledging that um, well, Wednesday is intrinsically context sensitive. I frankly doubt if, if, if this is going to be the judgment where we try and sort all this out, but I just want to make sure we're up to date. Thank you. But anyway, however one approaches Wensbury, you're in the, the most extreme form of intensity here, um, we submit. It's not a, it's not a hard edge question here, uh, in, in that um, dishonesty and unfairness 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 Yes, I, I would accept that, and, and of course that's consistent with what the Supreme Court said in the Ivy and Genting Casinos case, that there needs to be an evaluation of whether dishonesty... Is Nevertheless, the decision you reach at the end is binary. You either yes, were yes. dishonest or you weren't. And you can't I, say, well, <coughs> somewhere in between. Yes, and my, and my Lord anticipates the point I was going to come to. Nevertheless, there either is dishonesty properly understood objectively in the way that Ivy says there is dishonesty or not, or, or there isn't. Um, so... You have to work out whether there's dishonesty, and I suppose the Secretary of State's entitled to some margin of appreciation, to use another best expression um, in that regard. But ultimately, there either is dishonesty as a matter of objective reality or not, we say, applying my view. Mr. Boots, are you at some stage, before you sit down, going to show us the decision letter in your for the client's case? Yes, I, I will do. Um, I, I will come on to that at the end of my speech. That would be helpful. Thank you. Cool. Um, so, um, finally on Wensbury, can I just deal with Mr. Justice Spencer's judgment in Khan and, and the, the approach to the application of Wensbury in this context? So, we've looked at that already. It's at tab um, 65. I, I won't ask you to go to it. We say that Well, I think I will, if you don't mind. Oh, of course. Um, so, that's tab 65. Yes. Mr. Justice uh, Martin Spencer sets out general guidance to be applied in these cases. Yes, which particular part do you want us to look at? Well, it's the entirety of the guidance, I think, my lords, that you'll need to have in mind. Now, as I've indicated already in my submissions, we've got no difficulty with um, the acknowledgement that dishonesty is a necessary requirement before 3225 can be used here. But there are four problems, we say, with the approach in this judgment, taking in this judgment. <coughs> um, the first is that it doesn't acknowledge the need for a balancing of factors, the Ingao point, if I can put it like that. Secondly, it doesn't acknowledge the procedural difficulties that a migrant faces in putting forward the sort of evidence. A balancing factors at stage one. At that, that, yes, exactly, at the end of stage one. Yeah. Sorry, and then your second point? Second point is that it doesn't acknowledge the difficulties a migrant will face in putting forward the sort of evidence that Mr. Justice Spencer had in mind. So he says, if you look at page 1873 of the bundle, Roman 4, points out that it might not be enough for a migrant to barely assert without further support that a mistake was made by an encounter. Um, and at five, he, he follows on from that uh, and refers to the sort of evidence that might want to be put forward and builds on that again at Roman six. Seven. 
So what's wrong with any of that? Well, nothing is wrong with it in principle, absolutely. But the problem, and this is the point I'm making, is that the procedures in place, certainly at the time of my client, the decision-making regarding my client, did not <coughs> allow Mr. Balajagao to put forward the sort of evidence in issue. Well, we're really slipping into the procedural fairness we, we, point, aren't we? We are, we are. But it's also relevant when assessing the Wens when asking the Wensford question, because the Secretary of State won't have any of that material, and there wouldn't have been an opportunity for my client to put it forward. So that's the second um, concern we have. The third point is that uh, it, it may be too much for, for Mr Justice Spencer to say um, that you can infer dishonesty merely from a difference in information regarding income provided between a, a, a tax return and a statement of income for the Home Office. And this is a point that the OG and Dadsey cases, um, the, the Scottish cases, um, make. So if we can perhaps turn those up, there at uh, uh, tabs 57 and 58, let's just look at OG at tab 57, um, at paragraph 30, that's tab 57, that's paragraph 30, page 1670. Tyree held was that, that the Secretary of State's decision making in those cases was, was based simply on the discrepancy, if I can put it like that. And that wasn't enough because the discrepancy was intrinsically ambiguous. And we submit that one potential problem with Mr. Justice Spencer's approach in Khan is that he fails to acknowledge that ambiguity. And so the correct approach, we say, is for um, it to be acknowledged that there may be a Wensbury reasonable suspicion arising as a result of the discrepancy, <coughs> but the, 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 the uh, belief that there has been dishonesty can only arise after um, the Secretary of State has reliable evidence to reject an explanation for the discrepancy that's been put forward. And finally, it doesn't, and this is the fourth and final point uh, in terms of the Khan case, there's no engagement with the tame side duty, which my then friend Mr. Sane will come on to. You might also say, I don't know if you do, that Mr Justice Martin Spencer appears to shift the burden onto the individual concerned. Yes. So, so his, his reasoning appears to be, at paragraph Roman 1, the mere fact of a discrepancy can give rise to a legitimate inference of dishonesty, yes. which he then calls in Roman 2 a prima facie case of dishonesty. We do take that point. Uh, that's right. essentially your, exactly. in, differently slightly, expressed, it's exactly. your point three. I put it slightly yes. differently, but that's yes. we do make that point. Yes. So the, the way we see it is that you might have a way to be reasonable suspicion. That's not good enough for B and five purposes. Um, that suspicion would have to crystallise into a way to be reasonable belief. And that can only happen once you've got reliable evidence to reject an explanation to put forward. And at that stage, you'd have to acknowledge the inherent limitations on a migrant putting forward an explanation supported by evidence. Uh, but, 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 I don't quibble with the way my law puts it. Um, I think that, that that's essentially how it is. So that, that's our position in terms of the car case and the guidance. Turning then to procedural fairness, um, I hope I can deal with this quite quickly. We say that the procedural requirements of procedural fairness are clear and well established. Um, if you want to look at them, um, you can find them in Bank, Bank Mellat, uh, Authorities Tab 28, uh, paragraphs 28 to 30. Paragraphs 28 to 30, and paragraphs 35 to 36, pages 795 to 6, and 798. Essentially, it's due notice of the allegation and a reasonable opportunity to respond to it. And similarly, Osborne, tab 27, paragraphs 65 to 72, where the justification uh, and underpinning principles with respect to procedural fairness are referred to by the Supreme and where it's pointed out that even the content of the duty of fairness is a matter for the court, and not for the Secretary of State. So that's Authorities Tab 27, pages 708 to 710. Now, um, we will refer... Sorry, that's, to that's still Osborne. That's, that's Osborne, yeah. Okay. Um, and of course, these are just trial principles in my respectful submission. Um, now, uh, we were referred very helpfully, if I may say so, to the Fire case yesterday. Um, we've got copies of that available. Can I hand that up? case I'd be thought to be um, 
claiming credit where none is due, although the request came from me, the, uh, the thought came from my lord. Yes, well, I had thought as much, which is why I thought perhaps both requests came from my lord. Or Justice. I see that my lord, Lord Justice Singh, has some uh, deep involvement in the case. Um, uh, um, so, we say that FIAD is, is, is relevant, is of real assistance, Thank because there's a, there's a clear analogy. Uh, it dealt with um, the situation where an applicant had applied for nationality, and, and that application was refused purely on character grounds, and it was held that the refusal decision on that basis engaged common law procedural fairness principles. Now, that was enough to lead to a public law relief in this case, because no reasons were given for the decision. Um, but what it does show is that there is undoubtedly a duty to act fairly in, in the instant case we submit, because the instant case is a fortiori, uh, because of the hostile environment um, that the decisions expose the appellants to. And we say there's no difference between the nationality context and the instant context. And, and indeed, presumably, there's the risk of removal. Yes. So <coughs> this was a nationality. He, he wouldn't have been... That's right. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm going too quickly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, all of the factors that I've highlighted earlier today as, as in terms of detriment as a result of these decisions, so exposure to risk of detention, removal, etc., deprivation of the other, the entitlement to ILR that would otherwise be the case, that you'd otherwise have, all of those factors show that uh, uh, procedural fairness applies. Um, and the reason that the Secretary of State can't and hasn't act, acted um, in accordance with the demands of common law procedural fairness in, in this case is that... Um, there has been no notice in advance of a final decision um, and a reasonable opportunity to respond to the allegation in this case or in any of these cases. Uh, and that's because, um, as we saw earlier today, uh, the administrative review process um, limits uh, the uh, applicant for administrative review to the material that was before the decision maker. And the crucial point here is that um, the Secretary of State has made the allegation of dishonesty and undesirability essentially from an innocent migrant's point of view, out of the blue. And there's been, therefore, no opportunity um, to that given to that migrant to properly respond to that allegation before it was made, which itself is not compliant <coughs> with tri procedural fairness principles. And even at the stage of the administrative review process, there's no opportunity to meaningfully or reasonably respond because you can't put forward the sort of evidence that Mr Justice Spencer had in mind. Just suppose that the administrative review procedure did allow to produce evidence in the meantime. Would you accept that that was sufficient? That would be um, a much easier case for the Secretary of State. The reason I, I won't accept it on my feet now is that it might, there may be a difficulty in the Secretary of State um, accepting, rejecting an explanation, a detailed explanation, shall we say, um, for a discrepancy um, without perhaps conducting an interview or having some means of assessing the credibility of the applicant's explanation. So well, I, that's a separate that's a separate point. I think really what I was just wondering about was, in another context, what might be done is you write a minded to letter and then make the decision after there's been an opportunity to respond. If the administrative review was a full review and allowed further evidence, it could nevertheless be said, I'm not encouraging you to take this point, I just want to understand it, well, that's not quite the same because the Secretary of State's already made a decision. He's just being asked to review it subsequently. Much better for him not to make it first. The oh. answer to that might be it's substance and form because you could say the same about a minded two letter in practice. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a pro. I think it's to be fair to the Secretary of State. I think if the administrative review process was robust um, and otherwise entirely <coughs> scrupulous and fair in terms of the demands of common law procedural fairness, it would be a difficult point for me to take. But because the allegation is made in final terms in a refusal letter which was subject to administrative review, um, that um, the demands of procedural fairness weren't met. Because you've got to look at the decision making as a whole yes. in context. And I do acknowledge that Section 3C extends leave until the uh, admin review process concludes, and that, for example, it's now accepted um, um, it by the upper tribunal in the Secretary of State that an application for judicial review can, uh, the time limit for bringing an application for judicial review, for example, doesn't start until the AR process is concluded. So one way of looking at this is that the AR process is part of the, a, 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 a continuous decision-making process. Yes. Uh, but that's well, not I think a that's a sensible concession. I'm grateful. Uh, but uh, I suppose that that's not a point necessarily arises in this case. Um, 
so, so we say that the um, requirements of proceeding defence aren't met in this case. Um, none of the appellants were given an the opportunity to respond to an allegation of dishonesty, let alone the allegation of undesirability. Some of them were given an opportunity to comment about the reasons for a tax discrepancy, if I can put it like that. But they weren't, the allegations of dishonesty and undesirability were never put to them until the AR stage. Remind me in which case there was some, which were the cases where it came to totally out of the blue? Well, we, it, it, my, my client's case is one. Yeah. There, there was a, um, a very brief questionnaire, which is at page 250 to 251 of the appellant's bundle. It's a two page document and it simply asks, are you happy with your tax returns? Yes. My client actually answered yes, and in hindsight, it was probably wrong to do that, but he's explained in his subsequent evidence why he felt he should answer yes. And then there was a very brief box um, following that question, allowing an opportunity to explain why there was a, an amendment. That's totally different from uh, the section of state putting an allegation of dishonesty, let alone undesirability to an item, um, and doesn't contrive. All right, but then take the case, the next case up, where, where you are, the discrepancies are shown, and you're invited to explain the discrepancy. There's no explicit uh, allegation or raising of the issue of dishonesty. But would that be necessary? It if someone be. says to you, your tax return on which you relied at this time says X, and your tax return which you and your um, uh, application says Y, and there's a big discrepancy, uh, most people would understand that one of the that one of the things that the, the secretary is interested in is whether this is honest or careless, or not a discrepancy at all. Because once the figures are properly understood, I, I accept that a, that a sophisticated person coming to, to that issue would, would, would normally anticipate that. But of course, this has got to cater to people in all sorts of situations. It may even concern a migrant whose um, English ability is not ideal. And um, in my submission, it's, it, it is demand. There, there is a demand imposed by the common law in terms of procedural fairness, that the Secretary of State fairly and squarely put the allegation of dishonesty, and perhaps more importantly, the allegation of undesirability based on it, to a migrant, because there's a need for a balancing exercise apart from anything else. It's not just about dishonesty. I mean, one response a migrant might uh, advance is, well, yes, I was dishonest 10 years ago. These were the reasons for it. It's a great regret, but look at my character and conduct after that point. I'm no longer an undesirable person. And unless the Secretary of State takes the undesirability point, gives the migrants an opportunity to respond to that point, um, then the migrant is, can't be expected to respond to that by providing, say, character evidence or whatever. And my Lord, that's my response. Thank you. Um, now, finally, on, on procedural fairness, um, as a general matter at least, um, if, if, as we say, is clearly the position in these cases, there was uh, procedural unfairness, the makes no difference argument should not be accepted. Um, as a response to it, applying the well-known um, observations of um, Lord Justice Bingham, as, as he then was, at Paro 60 to 61 in the ex parte Cotton case. That's at tab 55, page 1645. Um, and, and my laws will be very familiar with that. Lord Justice Bingham explains that reality and experience shows that even hopeless cases can turn out somehow to be won. Which goes back to John and Reese. He, he, he would yeah. cite that, so probably Mr. Justice McGarry's um, judgment there, yes. Um, and so um, the reality is, given the nature of the allegation here, dishonesty, and the um, uh, need for a uh, assessment of undesirability, which is going to be very fact sensitive, um, um, it, it's almost going to be impossible for the Secretary of State to rely on making those <coughs> And that's uh, certainly uh, the position in Mr. Badger Gary's case. Sorry, uh, one authority on which the Secretary of State relies in this context, and it's a fairly close analogy, it might at first be thought, is Mehmet and Ali, in which. Um, uh, this court said, I think quite shortly, um, no obligation on the Secretary of State to uh, give prior notice of an allegation of, uh, of, a, of a removal decision based on an allegation of cheating. Yes. Am I? Um, I'm, I'm very grateful, my Lord. I had intended to deal with that. I missed it out on my note. Um, if you just bear with me. So that's tab 45. And it's paragraph 72, right at the end of the judgment. <coughs> That's page 1434, right at the end of the tab. And, and 
me say again, when this paragraph is read completely and fairly, it's no answer, because Lord Justice Sweetson's observations are in the context of an expectation that there will be a fair process by way of an out-of-country appeal, which will allow for the procedural fairness argument to be fully dealt with there. So the unfairness argument was being advanced in Mahmood and Ali as a special exceptional factor justifying an in-country challenge to a Section 10 decision on the basis of the limb line of authority. You may be right. Um, Para 72 is clearly referring back to an argument which has been set out earlier from, I think, Mr. Malik. Um, and I... Can you tell, just show us... Well, so this, uh, yes. Um. Mr. Mallet's arguments, I think, are set out at paragraph four seven page four seven six following. Um. Yes, it's. I see. It doesn't help very much. Uh, it says paragraph fifty five. The first factor is the removal decision was taken without prior notice, and Mr. Ali had no opportunity to make representations. No, well, I think that is. Why is that not like the present well, case? If we go back to the page, paragraph 49, page 1429, you can see that that was one of the special exceptional factors that Mr. Malik Craig made on behalf of the appellant in that case. So this wasn't a, uh, an argument for procedural fairness implicitly, it was an argument that there was a special <coughs> exceptional factor because, presumably, of the strength of the procedural fairness argument which meant that there could be an in-country challenge to the Section 10 decision. And of course, if that argument was right, the limb line of cases wouldn't work, because it's just it, factually the position that Section 10 decisions were taken without notice. Um, and if you go back to paragraph 72, you can see that that analysis is, is made, is, is, is plainly correct with respect from the last sentence of paragraph 72, next to line marking F. But the question... Yes, I see. Mm. No, thank you. Um, so so that's, that's why that doesn't assist the Secretary of State in my submission. Of course, it's right to point out that the, the, the point about gist of the evidence um, is not the content of, of the duty under the Duke Cooper. <coughs> that, that plate, I don't think that's controversial. Just being given the gist of an allegation doesn't give you a procedurally fair opportunity to respond to it. Well, that's a different point anyway. It, it is a different point, um, but... No, You've you. got that's, my submissions on that. Okay. I should also, uh, before I uh, move on to conclude, um, deal with the EK Ivory Coast case, which is another authority that my learned friends rely upon against us on the procedural fairness point. That's authorities tab 46, paragraph, and I'd ask my lords just to note paragraphs 27 <coughs> to 31. Can we briefly turn that up? So tab 46, as it happens, following tab. Here, Lord Justice Sales, as his own words, explains that the usual ex parte duty principles had a, um, a relaxed content, if I can put it like that, in that particular context because they, the, the, the context was applications under the points based system, and the points based system required uh, prioritised certainty, if you like, over fairness and flexibility, and that policy informed the approach of the courts to the application of, ex of, of duty principles. Now, the reason EK Ivory Coast doesn't assist the Secretary of State in this case is twofold. Well, <coughs> sorry, there's one response. We're not in the points-based system as far as is for, for material purposes here because the allegation the Secretary of State has made is an allegation under the general grounds of refusal. So it's an allegation the Secretary of State has made out of the blue potentially at least, which doesn't dovetail with the uh, requirements a migrant has to meet under the specific immigration rule that's being relied upon. So the policy of certainty over fairness or flexibility doesn't have any purchase in this context. Um, and the Secretary of State is the one making the allegation for the first time, and it's a very serious allegation. Those 
contextual factors were not present in the UK IP codes, and so the case simply cannot assist the Secretary of State. So moving on, um, just to conclude my submissions, unless my lords have any questions about the procedure of fairness, um, I'm, I'm content to rely upon the skeleton argument in terms of the case-specific arguments that I've not already covered. Are you going to show us the decision letter? Yes, I, I will do that. Okay. So, Just a tiny point, a learning point. It would be useful to have numbers on the back so you always know where it was written. And the, likewise, while I'm on it, the authorities, which in every other way are admirably put together, um, if you say tab 47, you you have to remember which bundle it's in. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I don't want to derogate from what I said. These are very well put together bundles. Thank you. So I think let, let, let's start with the first decision in order. So the first decision is dated is, is by a letter dated 9th of June 2016. It's at page 142. <coughs> and you can see the salient reasoning on page 144. Uh, yes. Uh, it's, 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 if I say so, speaking for myself, that it's, it's really the first half of 145 that, that I would certainly welcome some assistance on. Yes. Just to see on analysis what the steps and the reasoning appear to be. Yes, well, essentially what the Secretary of State says, if we look at 145 and the paragraph just next to the first whole bunch, mm. um, um, is that it's, it's not accepted that there was a genuine error. Well, well, I think you have to go to the previous yes. paragraph, don't you? Yes, in the previous paragraph, what's uh, noticed is there's a discrepancy. Yes. Right? Not consistently your declarations, the discrepancy between your declarations to both the government bodies, past doubts over. So that's how it's put there, past doubt. Uh, past doubt including on your conduct and character. Yes. So that gets into the language of 3225. Then it goes on to 3225 expressly, notes that it's not a mandatory refusal. However, the evidence submitted does not satisfactorily demonstrate that the failure to declare to HMRC dot, 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 was a genuine error. Yes. Now, there was no evidence submitted because the applicant didn't have an opportunity to deal with this. And insofar as the Secretary of State placed a burden on, on the applicant simply by virtue of the discrepancy, that was wrong for the give, reasons given in the OG case. The discrepancy was intrinsically ambiguous. And so we say the Secretary of State had to have a reasonable foundation for, for inferring dishonesty in this case. And because the applicant wasn't given an opportunity to explain, there was no such basis. And this perhaps tallies in with what my own friend said. Well, Harry, you're about. running together two points, aren't you? I think your first point would be it's not because he wasn't given an opportunity to explain, mm -hmm. simply. Quite apart from that, showing a discrepancy uh, uh, and saying that is prima facie evidence of dishonesty, you say is wrong in principle. Yes. Yeah. Then you say, and wasn't given an opportunity to explain. Well, yes, in, in, in the context of the assertion um, that the evidence submitted, does, the, the Secretary of State's assertion, that the evidence submitted does not satisfactorily demonstrate that the failure to declare, etc., was a genuine error. Well, you may see the same form of words used in the other uh, refusal decisions in these appeals, but the reality here was that the applicant never had an opportunity to put forward that evidence. But there's, there's a middle way, at least conceptually. Yes. It could have been a careless error, for example. Yes. 
Or it could have been a reckless error. Yeah, whatever. But um, what, what seems to be going on here, and we'll have to listen to the Secretary of State's response, obviously, but on the face of this reasoning, it appears to go from step one, little discrepancy, to uh, step two, there isn't an explanation for gen that it was a genuine error. To step three, in the middle paragraph, the Secretary of State considers that you have been deceitful or dishonest. Yes. So we, we say applying the heightened standard of review, or whatever one wants to call it in this case, and applying the correct approach that I sought to outline earlier today, this reasoning just doesn't pass muster. Um, the Secretary of State has essentially concluded, merely on the basis of a discrepancy, that there's dishonesty, and that's not an adequate way to reason in this case. That's what he's um, And insofar as the Secretary of State relies on uh, the uh, applicant's responsibility, then that's a separate error because Treaty 2.5 is only available to the Secretary of State in this type of case where there's dishonesty. Now, in fairness to the Secretary of State, we should also look at the um, administrative review decision. Just which, before we go there... There's a slight inconsistency between the first full paragraph and the second. The first full <coughs> paragraph um, basically says, because of the discrepancy, we decide that you uh, lied to HMRC, you understated your earnings. Yes. Logically, there are two possibilities. One, that you uh, uh, told the revenue rightly that you were earning almost nothing, but you bigged it up in order to pass the application this time round, or the other way round. But they put their, they, they nail their colours to the line to the revenue last in the first para. But then in the second full para, they seem implicitly to say it could be either, because it's to your advantage, it's to your advantage to um, understate your income to pay less tax, but it's to your advantage to overstate your income to be entitled to ILR. Well, it's, it's slightly incoherent. It, it is incoherent, and it's very unfair for the Secretary of State to err on the side of the most cynical interpretation possible by assuming that someone is going to act dishonestly or has acted dishonestly because it might be in their interest to do that. I mean, that's just not the way that the world works. That people don't act dishonestly in general run of cases, otherwise the society <coughs> doesn't function. But because <coughs> may submit that the reasoning here is incoherent, doesn't show that applying actual scrutiny the correct principles have been applied and that all relevant circumstances have been taken into account. And we deal with this by reference to four particular factors in the skeleton which I can take to people. I don't propose to take time for. Um, we should look at the 20th of July 2016 decision on the AR application, which is at page 158. Um, this was the Secretary of State, the, the Secretary of State's opportunity to respond to the applicant's explanation because before the 20th of July uh, 16 letter, the Secretary of State had never given the applicant any kind of opportunity to respond. Um, but the extent of the Secretary of State's reasoning in response is set out <coughs> in the passage. It's got a couple of lines next to it, next to the... Uh, so sorry, I was just making a note. Where are we? So it's page 158. Um, and I'd ask my lords to look at the passage that's been line marked on the side on page 159. This is the AR decision. I'm sorry, mine hasn't got any mine. Yes. Yes. Oh. I'm really sorry, I'm not sure why that is. But any, anyway, it's, it's the passage on page 159 next to the bottom hole punch that begins, you claim the discrepancy. <coughs> and that's the extent of the Secretary of State reasoning in, 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 reject, in support of the rejection of the appellant's innocent explanation. We say that's, that's not adequate. But the second point made is really the same as the first. So, uh, it's, it's perhaps not quite right to say they ju he jumped straight from discrepancy to dishonesty. In both letters, he says uh, discrepancy and motive to mislead one or other, therefore discrepancy. Yes. Um, but that... that but you say that's still not enough. That's not enough, as it, because it's a, it's a generic point, and the reality is that any reasonable decision maker would have acknowledged that although everyone has a motive to, to lie and cheat, um, the majority of people don't have that way. It's not a good enough way to respond and to just to, to, to make a very serious decision like this. And when it comes to the Secretary of State's res particular response to the applicant's explanation on page 159, the reasoning is again generic, 
there's reference to a personal responsibility, which is not the same thing as dishonesty. It's basically a negligence, reference to a negligence standard, which, which is not, um, uh, you know, acting negligently is not a sufficiently reprehensible conduct in this context, as I've explained earlier. And that reasoning is not sufficiently say in all the circumstances to meet the demands of anxious scrutiny applied in this context. And we also say, and this is a separate argument, have developed in the skeleton argument that there's been no engagement with the requirement for a balancing exercise. We also say that there's been um, no um, seeking out of necessary information, both in terms of <coughs> obtaining evidence from the applicant in terms of a balancing exercise, so evidence about his good character or whatever he might want to say in response to an allegation of undesirability, but also possibly in terms of HMRC's views, and this is something my learned friend Mr. Sane will come on to. Um, and, and, and I've already explained why the decision-making here is procedurally unfair. So, my lords, with the caveat that I rely upon um, the case-specific arguments detailed in our, in our skeleton <coughs> argument, um, from paragraph 135 onwards, um, I, I propose to end there, but subject to this, at the outset of my submissions, um, my Lord Lord Justice Underhill um, highlighted three topics or factors that needed to be canvassed. Um, the first was um, what's the correct approach to 3 5 well, we've covered that um, the second is um, how does Article 8 work and just to be clear we say that Article 8 works in the way that Parliament in the Human Rights Act says it works the applicants can challenge Article 8 these decisions on Article 8 grounds and the Secretary of State if, if he wants to be part of the decision maker and avoid the use of judicial review in that way can follow the RSAM procedure and we say that's a sensible um, process that should be followed in the general run of these cases, and that I think answers my Lord's third uh, yep. issue, which is um, what's the procedure in terms of Article 8, how should these decisions be made? My Lord, unless you have any questions, those are my questions. No, thank you, that's been um, extremely helpful and admirably succinct. Great. Yes, Mr. Sainz. <coughs> my lords, I'm grateful. Um, my lords, I intend to briefly cover the following topics. If I can set them out at the start, it might be helpful. Um, as my Lord Lord Justice Underhill stated at the outset that two of the appeals may be academic, I'm going to briefly, and I say only briefly, touch upon that in the instance of my client specifically, uh, uh, and thereafter deal with, um, as Mr. Biggs has canvassed, the issue of uh, the interactions of Secretary of State and her powers to interact with HMRC, the tame sign duty as it may apply to these particular circumstances and thereafter the relevance of HMRC's penalties regime, again in this particular context of tax amendments. I will what only was your third point? Interactions? Uh, interactions with, between HMRC... Yes, that was your second point. What's the third one after that? The tame side duty. Tame side. And then the final one? Penalties regime. That is that subcontained subject. I will then um, briefly touch upon, because it is, hasn't been covered yet by Mr. Biggs, the subject of um, paragraphs 19K and I, and particularly in the context of uh, my client's appeal, um, and then I would hopefully, I say, vote. My Lord, <coughs> for the reasons already given in my um, skeleton argument on behalf of Mr. Albert, uh, and it is contained at paragraph 16 to 19 of that argument, and again, for the reasons given succinctly at paragraphs 30 to 31 of the response skeleton, uh, I'm not giving page numbers for the skeleton bundle unless my lord... No, 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 paragraph numbers are good. Uh, for those reasons, we say, uh, well, I say on behalf of Mr. Albert, that the appeal is certainly not academic. Um, by way of background, on the 8th of August 2018, last year, um, there was a communication exchange between my instructed solicitor and the uh, GLD solicitor in this particular matter. Now, do we need all this about whether it's academic? Um, 
I made it clear at the beginning that uh, we, want, we wanted to hear the points raised by the academic cases. I, I will only be... All right, I think, OK, let, well, just, just bear in mind that... Yeah, um, absolutely, well, I'm, I'm not... OK, I'll keep quiet, keep, 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 but give, give us succinctly the points you want to make. Well, in an email exchange between my solicitor and that of uh, from GLD, there was an acceptance that the claim was not academic. That was put in writing in the form of copy into the email as well. Given that email, it's not clear now why the claim is now said to be academic. There's been no development since that point in time, other than one point, which is that in the parallel um, appeal, which is taking place in the tribunal appellate system, it has reached the stage that the um, Appellant succeeded in his first year tribunal appeal. The upper tribunal has um, indicated thus far, following an error of law hearing, that it intends to set aside at least a discrete part of the decision in relation to the continuity of residence. Now, the importance of this point is that the Secretary of State's case is that my client does not have 10 years continuous lawful residence. That is because, uh, to put it bluntly, there have been interruptions with that due to the bylaw application being refused. So one can see, based on the Secretary of State's own arguments, which are again raised in the skeleton argument, um, which is for my lord, that's paragraph 29, um, it can be seen that the, uh, the appeal is entirely unacademic in that if the court seeks to quash the decision of point-based application for settlement, as opposed to a 10-year lawful long residence application for settlement, uh, my client would then have Section 3C leave or continuous lawful leave by virtue of the decision becoming um, null or deleted, if I can put it that way. That would then, again briefly, have implications in terms of the effect that could or should happen in light of what um, my Lord Lord Justice Singh said in the Ashish Khan case at uh, paragraph 37, Roman 2. There was discussion of what would happen in an ETS scenario where there'd be an extra scale of leave or if someone had applied in time for the uh, for a further grant of leave and they had been refused on that event. This is the mirror scenario here. Uh, I won't delve into that. Um, I have the kind of reference to have it. It, it can assist. Um, paragraph 37.2 of Ashish Khan can be seen at tab 36 in volume 2, and that is on page 1154. Um, before I, uh, I leave the parallel proceedings, it, it may intrigue the court to know that, um, uh, and it is relevant to, 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 to the submissions I will make later in terms of paragraph 19. In the course of the first year tribunal decision... Well, have we got the first year tribunal decision? Yes, we do, my lord. Where is it? It's in the... Is it, um, it is. I, I, it's a page... 300 and, well, it's, it's 327 of that bundle discreetly, but the bottom in bold in pagination is 185. Well, I, I'm not asking to see it now. Thank you. Obviously, the limited time we had for pre-reading, I hadn't read all the documents. It wasn't clear whether we had it. It's 1864. The only matter I seek to highlight is that it, it, uh, in terms of paragraph 21 on page 1863, the appellant was cross-examined heavily and following those questions put to him, the presenting officer did not seek to uh, challenge his account in terms of this being an innocent error. That hasn't been challenged by um, my learned friend Mr Malik who appeared in the tribunal proceedings. And got Have we got the trial? We you say there's been a very recent tribunal decision. Uh, there has. It hasn't been issued yet in writing. We've only been given oral I indication see. by the other tribunal. I think it would be helpful, nevertheless. To have, have you not even had the order? No. No matter. <coughs> um, it's been delayed somewhat since uh, mid-December. For some reason, it hasn't emanated yet. Well, I think as soon as you have the reason and the judgment, 
not because it's likely to be relevant to any of the issues before us, but one wants to have a complete picture always of what of the position is. Thank well, you. Moving then to the team side issues. Um, well, I, would, I, would I don't mind you moving to the team side issues at all. It's, just, it's not the order you said you were going to take it in. But, um, well, uh, well, no, that's I, fine, I'm but I just want to keep... The term, team side. Uh, I'm going to first discuss the interaction or interrelation between the Secretary of State's Department and HMRC. That's what I thought you were going to do. It's just yes. you were departing from your... Okay. Uh, so, to be clear, my lords, the three points I mentioned in the context of uh, the Counting Regime and the Team Side Duty are all under this uh, passage which is about to follow in terms of my submission. Uh, my lords, in the Secretary of State skeleton, um, at paragraph 4, Roman 4 to 5, and at paragraph 56 to 58, there are references therein to the history or his, the historical connection or interaction between the Secretary of State and HMRC in relation to these uh, cohorts of T1 general migrant cases. I'm giving those paragraph references um, without turning to them because I'm going to turn to instead the uh, Secretary of State's review on paragraph 3 to 5, <coughs> which can be found in volume 3 of the authorities at tab 78. How much of it do you want us to read? So the first paragraph, my lords, of 3.1, which starts HMRC and the Home Office's development. Okay. Yes. It is also relevant that against the second hole punch, there is a short sentence that starts in response to this pattern. Well, we better just see what the pattern is. One can then see turning. Give me one moment if I find the page reference. If my lords look across the page to paragraph uh, page two two three seven, the yes. next excerpt I would like to draw my lords' attention to is that which starts the technical question. The Paragraph against the first hole punch. Okay, let's just read that. What is GGFR? Uh, those are the general grounds for review for my. Oh, life. of course. Well, also, I, I draw attention to this paragraph because it draws a, a fairly firm line under the evolution of these refusals of settlement applications. As one can see, they first started on the basis of paragraph 322, subparagraph 2, and if my lords want to see um, the rule itself, my lords will have to turn back to the first uh, we, we, we were shown this earlier. Well, my lords, that, that is the rule that relates to um, false representations and documentation in a previous application, to put it in a nutshell. Uh, in terms of paragraph 325, we've now seen quite clearly the nature of it, and one can see that the shift that occurred from paragraph 322.2 to 322.5 is simply because of the fact that the Secretary of State is going to capture the possibility that an applicant has misled HMRC rather than UKBI. That is important in terms of understanding the context of the Secretary of State's shift in refusals. So it, quite, it also quite plainly shows in my humble submission that the paragraph isn't one that is drafted for this purpose. It is the best available means the Secretary of State has um, 
other than drafting a brand new rule, of course, because she's entitled to do so under Section 3.2 of the Immigration Act 1971. With that in mind, my submission would be, my, my lords, that the question, therefore, in each of these cases which raises paragraph 322.5 is a factual one as to whether the migrant has defrauded HMRC or not. If it were a question of whether the migrant has solely defrauded UKBI in a previous application, one would expect to see 322.2 alone. But, but, but what's wrong with the Secretary of State saying um, there is a discrepancy in the declarations of income over the same period? They can't both be right. Uh, one of them must be wrong. And then we, then we come to the different question of whether that's dishonest, either dishonesty yeah. and of the revenue or dishonesty or anything. In, indeed, my lord, I'm, I'm not criticising the pattern which HMRC has itself spotted, it's what became of the pattern thereafter, and the information exchange that is what I'm going to focus upon. And what I'm going to turn to, my lord, is to show that the information exchange is well and truly underway, and is fully fledged, but for one central piece of information which is not exchanged. You said that 3225 was aimed at, at um, uh, HMRC, but it's aimed at one or the other, isn't it? It is aimed at one or the other, but... One can see from the refusal letters that the focus is habitually or almost entirely upon what HMRC has or has not been told. In that context, it's important to see what power um, the Secretary of State had to demand such information, which I'm going to turn my Lord's attention to by May, before turning back to the review shortly. So, as is accepted in the Secretary of State's skeleton argument, and as is uh, raised in my skeleton argument also, the Secretary of State has the power to um, obtain information under Section 40 of the UK Borders Act 2007. That appears in the first volume of authorities at tab 6, pages 75 to 76. It is, as it says under Section 1A, for administering immigration control under the Immigration Act. But if one needs to know how um, far-reaching the power is, if one turns over and even looks at um, 1J, it is also can be used as much as doing anything else in connection with the exercise of immigration and nationality function. So one might think that it also could apply here to, in terms of this subsection because ILR, of course, will lead to a British citizenship application after one year of having held the same status. So, with that in mind, one can see that the statutory power to summon this information is extremely broad and far-reaching. The point that I made uh, by drawing attention to the, <coughs> the difference or divergence between paragraph 322.2 and 322.5 was that 322.2 on its own does not obviously point to an indication or an explicit basis of refusal for the reason that HMRC has been defrauded by a migrant. It is only 322.5 that will engage that paragraph. Yeah, we've got that point. The review. Thank you. I'm grateful, my lord. So, my lord, in terms of the cross-information sharing process, as my lords have seen on, in the review on page 236, and also as one can see Turning back to the review, at tab 78, page 2247, I'm also necessarily need to turn to it if I can read out the sentence. Well, I think it's useful to have it. Um, so, tab 78, page 2247, internal 19 of 20. Yeah. As one can see from the paragraph at the top of the page, starts with discussing the defences of these cases in judicial review. 
And it's a sense that the Arbitrary Tribunal has agreed that it's a second act by Shamarki as well as the primary discretion. However, it then flags up the use of this evidence, which is that the Home Office has increasingly made use of witness statements setting up evidence from HMRC to defend against legal challenges. So my Lords, I draw attention to this paragraph because it shows that not only is the Secretary of State operating a system whereby um, he is joined at the hip, essentially, with HMRC in the information exchange, uh, there can be no suggestion at all, um, say, in an EPI week context, that it would be inconvenient or uh, impractical for the Secretary of State to consult with HMRC to obtain any piece of information at all. The reason I draw attention to this is, um, will be become apparent now when I turn to the context of the chain side fusion. Uh, and to that end, um, I'm grateful um, to my learned friend for setting out the passage of um, Crown on the application of DK and the decision on Mr. Justice Kevin Hayes, who then was, uh, and that is paragraph 171 of that judgment. Now, the judgment can be found at tab 59 in the second <coughs> bundle of authority. <coughs> it's 59, it's the third bundle. Uh, forgive me, uh, forgive me. Uh, the, yes, I do apologize, apologize my Lord. Uh, the third bundle. The judgment appears at page 1683 start. The relevant passage, which is sidelined, can be seen starting on page 1705 under the heading classic same side principles. And what is said in the paragraph is fairly short, <coughs> and it's important is emphasized <coughs> when one reaches the fourth indented paragraph, uh, sorry, the fifth indented paragraph, uh, and the excerpt from Lord Justice Law's uh, judgment in uh, well, shall we the just, of Southwark. Let's just quickly, so if it's... Um, Yes, so if my Mr. Justice Hadden Cave, in fact, quoting himself in the Plantagenet Alliance case. It is my Yeah. yeah. Well, let, let, let's just quickly read that passage. Yes, my Um, I extrapolate upon paragraphs 5 and 6 of the internal um, excerpt from Plantagenet Alliance. Uh, turning first to paragraph 5 and the principle that the decision maker must call his own attention to considerations relevant, it must clearly be accepted by the Secretary of State that information from the revenue is relevant to this decision making process. Uh, it also must be accepted by the Secretary of State that HMRC has been uh, implicitly accepted as an outside body with particular knowledge or involvement in this sort of case. Quite plainly, that must follow, given that the review demonstrates that the pattern of potential fraud or concerns over amendment of taxes was brought to the Secretary of State's attention by the revenue. Following on from that, um, as it says quite clearly, the, the duty under this uh, principle of fraud arises from that of the Secretary of State to inform himself as to arrive at a rational conclusion. So it's implicit also from the information exchange that the Secretary of State has accepted that unless he consults with and obtains this information from HMRC to underpin and give support and succor to this decision to refuse settlement, the decision will be irrational. The sole question well, then... The, these generalities, or perhaps this is what you're about to come to, obviously not really what the case is about. What is it that you say, what are the inquiries that you say should have been made and weren't? I'm, I'm coming to that. <laughs> okay. Apologies. Uh, I, I can hurry it along if I can. Um, in terms, but I, it's important to emphasise these points because they have not been accepted by the Secretary of State um, to any extent at all. Yeah, finally, before leaving um, DK, the, <coughs> the sixth principle is important in that 
he discusses that the wider the discretion conferred, the more important it is that all relevant material is available. Now, as my lords have heard from my learned friend, Mr. Biggs, the discretion is extremely wide. This is an unfettered one. It shouldn't be confused, of course, with the residual discretion available to the Secretary of State under the Immigration Act 1971 per se. This is, of course, a rule which incorporates discretion into its very terms and nature. Uh, and given that it is of such a far-reaching nature, ranging, ranging from, as we have seen, terrorism offences to immigration breaches or fraud, allegedly, uh, in my humble submission, the information, of course, should be obtained, all of it, if it is relevant. Now, I say that the material I'm about to point to is germane to the very decision-making nature that the Secretary of State should and should undertake in terms of her decision, sorry, forgive me, his decision to be uh, Wensbury rational and reasonable. Turning then to the guidance, the there is, um, my lord, forgive me, you'll, you'll note that this is uh, my Mr. Skelton argument that discusses these points um, to the exclusion of others, in that this is a point um, I've taken since the outset of the appeal to this court. So the Penalties guidance, which I refer the court's attention to, is at tab 80 of I, the... I think it's not helping me, Mr. Singh, not to know... I, I can only understand your submissions if I know what it is you're saying they should have asked for and didn't. I'll say it in, in a sense, it's an alternative yes. material. What the Secretary should have asked for, uh, my lords, is an indication as to whether the migrant, when he or she has submitted his amended returns for a tax assessment, and I choose these words carefully, was liable to a penalty under the statutory regime, under Schedule 54. You say an indication of whether, uh, don't you just mean more straightforwardly, should have asked whether a penalty was imposed? Yes, my lord. Should have asked whether a penalty was imposed. Under right? Schedule 54 of the and is that is that is what this point is about, is it? it? Is, Okay, thank you. Okay, now where do you want us to go? My Lord, I, I would be grateful if my Lord could turn to tab 80 of the authority, volume 3. I'm sorry, tab 80. Tab 80. Yeah. Well, as my Lord will see, this is a piece of guidance from the UK website from HMRC. It has been published online since the 1st of January 2014 and was in force at the relevant time. My Lord, it's, it's plainly an overview for what is termed agents and advisors, which is HMRC's terminology for accountants, etc., or those who advise uh, migrant uh, taxpayers who compile it. It's important to flag out first that uh, under the second paragraph down, you and your client's responsibility for penalties, there is a section which states quite plainly, um, two points which are of assistance. I'll leave my lord to read those two. So wh what are you asking us to read? So under you and your client's responsibility for penalty. Both, both of the short both paragraphs. Sentences, okay, okay. Well, that. <coughs> <coughs> yes, we've got that point. My lords, I draw attention to these sentences because it is consistently said by the Secretary of State in his decision making that it is the responsibility of a migrant to maintain their tax affairs. I draw attention to this point because it is uh, explicit in the penalties guidance or the assessment of whether a penalty should be issued that the revenue is quite well and truly aware that a taxpayer is responsible for their own tax well, affairs. Course. They can't yeah, blame uh, that. Well, this is obvious affairs. stuff, Mr. Sandy. What? My Lord, it may seem obvious uh, to this room, but, but it, is, it, it consistently right. appears in decisions from the Secretary of State, which is why I'm drawing attention to it. Uh, it is I'm sorry, I must be misunderstanding the point. Are you saying that the Secretary of State some, regularly says something inconsistent with this? If so, what? Not inconsistent, but the point I make is that in terms of the relevance of the information that is being sought from Revenue and Customs, it is helpful at least to know that when Revenue and Customs do assess whether a penalty is due or not, they are mindful of the fact that the responsibility for accuracy in the return is something which a taxpayer is responsible for, not their Yeah, well, of course, yes. Okay. That's, that's the point Secretary of State has made in the, in the letters. Well, it's exactly the same point. There's no discrepancy. There. My Lord, that being so, and if we are in harmony on this point, it adds to my submission that the relevance of this information 
is... Well, look, let's get to the bottom of this, Mr Saini. What you're saying is that the fact that, that if they had asked whether a penalty had been imposed and had found, as they generally would, and would in all these cases, that the penalty hadn't been imposed, that would have been material to uh, the decision. Yes. Whether... Well, right, that's the point. It is, my Lord, I'm taking you to the, to the passage to demonstrate the manner in which the, uh, the, the revenue customs will assess whether a penalty is owing or not. But your, your point is that, uh, well, all right. Uh, it, is, um, it is important. I, I, th I think, all right, uh, but I, I think it's helpful to know where we're going, just to be shown lots of propositions. My Lord, uh, if one looks at the bottom of the page, yep. under the heading penalties for errors on returns, it states quite plainly that penalties can be charged as errors on returns under state or misrepresent tax liability. Yes, well, of course. That may seem apparent to my Lord at first. I'm setting it out for my Lord. Yes, OK, thank you. Uh, take this into account. Now, on the next page, page 2305, in between the two hole punches, there's a section that states that if uh, the taxpayer or the accountant sends in a document that contains a mistake, HMRC will, in a mandatory term, charge a penalty if the error is because of one of three factors. Now, this is important in terms of the evidence pointing to the fact that HMRC will have made an assessment as to the mental state or the subjective mindset of the taxpayer. This is what I was saying to my Lord. And my submissions will point to various approaches to assessing whether there has been deception or not. This is the first, and it indicates that there is a subjective assessment. The first bullet point, of course, uh, I'm not going to turn to it, but... Uh, it's covered later down the page under what reasonable care means, points to a lack of reasonable care, which is synonymous with carelessness or recklessness, or indeed negligence. The second and third bullet points, however, uh, concern deliberate behaviour. Now, in terms of deliberate behaviour, in my skeleton argument, I have pointed to the authority of uh, Tooth, which is a decision of Mr Justice Martha Smith in the Upper Tribunal Tax Chamber, uh, wherein at paragraph 64... It, dis it <coughs> makes the claim that deliberate behaviour is synonymous with deception. Yes, quite. So if there's any need for support for that submission, it is there. Uh, my Lord, I'll, I'll just give... Just, just before we leave tab that... Up. Sorry, just, just before we leave that citation, can we just note what comes after the third bullet point? The level of the penalty is linked to the reason why the error occurred. Yes, my Lord. Uh, the more serious the reason, the higher the maximum penalty can be. And as I understand it from your skeleton argument, uh, there are quite substantial differences between the penalty that will be imposed if the revenue could prove that there was a careless error Indeed. as opposed to a deliberate error. And, and one of the points I think you're making is that if they had conducted the Tameside inquiry, it's not only the fact that a penalty was or was not imposed that would have become known to the Home Office, but they would also have discovered whether the revenue had imposed the higher penalty, which is only imposed if it's a deliberate. Precisely, my lord. Um, I, I, I'm being pressed, but <coughs> the point is short, is that if there is a, a, a penalty that is above 20 to 30 percent of wrongfulness overly uh, on page 2306, in terms of how the inaccuracy penalty is calculated, if it's of that level, it indicates deception. So... My Lord, that is the point I seek to make on You said at page 2305, that's, that's the, if you or your client sends in a document that contains a mistake, the revenue will charge a penalty. Bind the revenue to charge a penalty. It doesn't bind the revenue to yeah. charge the penalty because there's a, 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 a... Well, for a lot, for quite a number of reasons, but, but it doesn't bind the revenue to impose a penalty. That paragraph itself says that the revenue can reduce the penalty um, if things are in good and Indeed it can, my Lord. And, and there is in the authorities an example of where the revenue has imposed a 100% penalty and has then reduced it to zero. Yes. But there is a distinction to be drawn, and, I'm, uh, and the point I make is that it's the first assessment of the revenue in terms of what the level of penalty should be in the first instance. Aside from any reduction, that is important. It is that which I point to, my Lord. In of course, the, the, the penalty can be reduced. Uh, as it says in terms of page 2306, can be reduced for telling HMRC about the errors, helping HMRC work out what tax is due, and giving access to figures. 
Um, so, so there's, nothing that wrong, there's nothing inconsistent with this policy. I mean, this is only a policy, so the, the revenue can depart from it if they want. Um, but the, there's nothing inconsistent with this policy. If somebody writes in and says, well, I've turned, so I've made a mistake, uh, here's, the, here's the back tax, with the revenue saying, fine, no tax. It would only be seen to find no penalty if the revenue accepted that was the taxpayer subjective well, mindset. Right. Well, well it's been put right. Yes. Hey, or they might it's just not worth making the inquiry. They've got a lot to do. They've got a lot to do, the revenue. They might think, uh, well, we've got the money. It's been volunteered. Uh, it's not worth inquiring whether it was careless or deliberate. My Lord, there is no evidence to suggest that, and in fact, the, I'm going to turn to it shortly, but the authority of Clay Army, um, which in fact the Secretary of State relies upon, shows that the revenue do make assessments in tier one general mining cases, and in that, in that matter in particular, a 100% penalty was levied upon the taxpayer. So it's not, it can't be said that the throwaway comment of the House and the response of skeleton that they may not have time, that there's an automation. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. And in fact, there is evidence here. Well, the boot's on the other foot, isn't it? You've got to show that there is evidence that they would always inquire into every case uh, and uh, would make a decision. Well, yes. In that and even then, of course, their decision wouldn't be binding on the... Um, uh, uh, on the Home Office. But leave that point aside. The real point is, why should we assume from the fact that there hasn't been a penalty imposed, <coughs> that the revenue have considered it and reached a deliberate decision on all the evidence before it, uh, that uh, the mistake was innocent. Because the regime for penalties is not uh, one which is um, drafted by HMRC necessarily, it, it arises from the Finance Act. So if my well, let's have a look. Tab, tab 7 of the Authority Finance Act, uh, Volume 1. <coughs> <coughs> I'll, I'll illustrate the point I make in terms of the primary legislation. So yes. Under tab 7 on the first page, page 79, under the schedule for 24, the very first part, error in tax payers' documents is to, to in subsection 1 to 4 is what's relevant. The penalty is payable by a person where... So, sorry, which page <coughs> are we on? In, so in, we're on page 79, error in taxpayer's documents. I'm so, so sorry, did you say behind tab 7? Yes, my lord. It should be the Finance Act 2007, Schedule 24, penalty for error. It is, but it isn't page 79. My starts at 111. I'll be across both. Behind tab 7, as you say, Schedule 24 penalties for errors runs from pages 111 to 179. Um, apologies, my lord. Could my lord turn back a, uh, behind the tab in case it has been misplaced? Now, page 79 in my bundle. Oh, I see. How odd. Yes. It apologies, it's meant lord. to be behind tab 7, is it? It is. Uh, okay, I don't know how that happened, but I've got it now. I do apologize, my lord. Right, sorry, I'm, I'm now with everyone else. Quite all right, my lord. Uh, my lord, the point I seek to make is that the, the Finance Act 2007 is framed in the uh, mandatory language, in that it doesn't dis, uh, reveal or disclose any element of disclosure here, such as the word may. A penalty is payable by a person where, uh, and this is also set out in my skirt scenario. Well, uh, I don't quite understand. A penalty is payable means there's a legal liability mm -hmm. to pay. It doesn't mean there's an obligation on the revenue to demand. I mean, well, with, with respect, that's, that's clearly right. I, I think it would come as quite a concern to taxpayers uh, and possibly the revenue itself if, if this submission is correct. Mm. Uh, firstly, um, uh, taxpayers uh, may be very concerned if they know that uh, if they may have made a careless error in a tax return, um, uh, they are they have to be charged a penalty for it. Uh, and secondly, in terms of collecting um, a 
uh, tax, uh, the revenue may, may well prefer a, a regime in which um, uh, individuals are encouraged to pay back tax. I mean, it, but all of these are matters of policy. But nothing in the Act requires the revenue uh, to impose penalties on uh, individuals, uh, nor does the policy. My Lord, I can only point to the framework of the legislation. It, it, it does state that a penalty is payable. But, but that's the point. It's one saying that as if that helps you. It doesn't help you. One, my Lord, one can presume that revenue customs would abide by the letter of the law. No, no. They, they, to say it's payable does not mean they are non, under an obligation to demand it. Your point about the letter of the law would arise if the statute said whenever they are aware of it, it is their duty to pursue it and recover every penny. Uh, I'm, unless you show us something else, uh, that is not their obligation. It's a power. My Lord, I, there is no other legislative no. point to you. But this is really quite a short point, isn't it? That's why I'm afraid I was a little bit discouraging about you really needing an hour and a half. Because the your submission on this depends, I think, on there being a legal duty on the revenue to demand a penalty in every case where they believe that there has been a careless and all the more so deliberate uh, error. And therefore, that it can be inferred from the fact, which would have been discovered if asked, that they hadn't made uh, uh, imposed a penalty, and certainly hadn't imposed a penalty for a deliberate um, uh, error, but the revenue, who might be expected to know best, to form the view that this was an innocent mistake. That's how your argument goes, isn't it? It is, my Lord. My Lord, the only indication I can point to is, is within the guidance where it stated that HMRC will charge a penalty if there's been an unmistakable misrepresentation of tax. But that's just a statement of, um, uh, that's not legislation. It isn't legislation, my Lord. And but exactly. it's, a, it's demonstrative of the intent the revenue has to charge penalties where there has been deception. And they can charge a nil penalty. Only if there has been a reduction due to various factors, which would be apparent on the face of their assessment in any event, uh, as the Canary judgment shows. I mean, I, I, I take your point that, principle, probably even on constitutional grounds, it's not a very good idea the revenue should have some whimsical discretion as to whether it should charge a penalty in one class of case rather than another. But the, uh, uh, and I don't suppose that is, that is the case, but it wouldn't surprise me the least that they had some internal practices of not charging for small amounts or not charging in situations where um, uh, someone volunteers the error and they have no particular reason to believe it's dishonest. Uh, and because I suspect the situation would be unmanageable if they had to pursue every single um, case. My Lord, I, I, I cannot, um, cannot say more on the point other than that. No, I mean, um, you've, been, uh, you've been very helpful. You've shown us the key provisions on which you rely, but it does depend, I think, on what, <coughs> on whether any relevant, <coughs> reliable inference can be drawn from the fact that the revenue haven't imposed a penalty. And your case is, yes, it can, um, because if they thought it was dishonest, they would have imposed a penalty. If, if I could put it this way, my lord, if there has been an assessment which gave rise to um, no penalty or the imposition of a penalty uh, for, for whatever measure uh, that is imposable, that would, of course, be relevant information. If there is no assessment which, which discloses such an assessment in terms of the penalties guidance, then there is no further relevant information to be had. But the duty falls upon the Secretary of State to make that information. Well, I suppose there's this point. Suppose there has been a penalty, but it's been deliberately calibrated at the carelessness level rather than the deliberate level, which would show, perhaps rather more than a not imposing a penalty at all, that the uh, revenue... Uh, had turned their mind to uh, whether it was deliberate or dishonest, deliberate or careless, I'm sorry. Well, my Lord, none of the decision letters in this matter disclose a penalty. I have, of course, in other matters, seen letters where it does give a penalty at the level of a lack of reasonable care, uh, equivalent to that of recklessness or 
Well, remind me, so, on the, in the facts of your case, there's no penalty. There's no penalty in mine. That's the new evidence. We'll I don't think in, in any of these cases there is actually evidence of a penalty, is there? No, but the, the, the importance of the new evidence in my client's case is that the letter which he received before it was referred to a specialist team stating in terms, I can turn to this le uh, later, that uh, this team may choose to levy a penalty upon you. So there was quite clear threat there and an implication that it has undergone that assessment before it came back as the tax being due and no penalty being imposed. That is why I say, my lord, that there is a threat of a, a penalty and, and, and quite clearly in, in any event, in my client's case, but that, suppose a case in which there has been a carelessness penalty. Yeah. Uh, your tame side point is, well, effectively, that the Secretary of State always ought to ask in case there's been a carelessness penalty, mm -hmm. because if there has been a carelessness penalty, that will show uh, that the... Uh, revenue, who are in the best position to know, perhaps, um, uh, have decided this was innocent. Uh, but the same result could be achieved, couldn't it, by saying that, uh, which I appreciate is another part of the case, but suppose there was an obligation on uh, the Secretary of State to give the uh, uh, migrant the opportunity to make submissions. The migrant could then say, "Look, I've been I, I suffered a penalty, and it was a carelessness penalty, and therefore I haven't acted dishonestly." Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that achieve the same result more effectively than a general tame side duty to check whether someone may have received a penalty, and if so, at what level? Only to the extent that the migrant may be able to extract information from HMRC as to the penalty. Well, they'll know. They? They, 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 they'll know. They'll know if they paid a penalty. Well, no. supposing there is, a, they don't receive a letter suggesting that they, it's being referred to a team which will consider issuing a penalty. Uh, well, that means nothing. I mean, say it's been, a letter has been received, to, referred to a team which will consider whether to issue a penalty. Doesn't doesn't um, tell you anything. Well, my lord, the, uh, I suppose I'm taking the Secretary of State's point, which was. Taking my lord's mind a moment ago, in that, how can one know that there has then been an assessment where there is no penalty due at all? Because it may have been, as my lord's are suggesting, there may not have been time to even look into it, and the revenue has accepted the tax, even though it may not be due or owing, which would be unusual. But if that is the case, and the revenue had accepted the tax that wasn't due, um, that would be what the Secretary of State might say. But my position is that. Given that there is an information exchange already established between the Home Department and Revenue Company, and given that <coughs> to the extent that there are witness statements and spreadsheets and things of that nature, and all the data possible, it will be unusual to not disclose this additional factor as to whether there has been an assessment and what the outcome of the penalty was. I accept, of course, what you say, my lord, that um, the migrant should have the opportunity to put forward that information, and that does go... That's, very a, separate, much. that's a separate limb of the argument, I appreciate yeah, that. But anyway, sticking to your limb, you say, irrespective of, of any um, other procedural fairness point, the Secretary of State should always ask whether a penalty has been imposed, and if so, at what level, because that may affect their 3225 decision. Indeed. And, yeah. and you pointed out the Secretary of State is certainly in a position to ask, because it asks for all the other information and gets help when it requires it. That's really the point, isn't it? We'll is have it? to think, yes. Because uh, uh, and the reason I was pointing to the burdens and uh, the paragraph on what reasonable care means at this term, the importance that it says that reasonable care is different according to each client's circumstances and abilities. Yes, of course. So that is important in terms of the HMRC not merely assessing the mindset, but also being mindful of whether it's a lay person such yeah. as my client and Well, so that we've we've slightly rushed you to get to the to the heart of the point, but they, that is the heart of the point. Is there any more you need to say about it? If I may just conclude uh, by saying uh, only a handful of points for another minute or two on this issue, <coughs> which is that, um, if I may, turn my Lord's attention to the general grounds for refusal, refusal guidance, which is in volume three, tab 77. And that is page 21. 
265. Uh, 265 is where it starts. 2167 and overleaf is the relevant section in this entitled What You Need to Check For. And more importantly, I'm halfway down, where to check for evidence. Now, this passage here clearly establishes that. There may be other, other information that's helpful. If so, you should see the appropriate HMRC check. And what it says overleaf, um, whilst we are looking at the guidance here, is uh, interesting in the last or the last bullet point, um, 2168. You must consider if there are any human rights problems, <coughs> such as the right to family life. Now, I, I simply flag that up because uh, it's a point that my learned friend may not have had the time to cover. So the guidance does suggest that checks should be made with HMRC. But, the, but the checks are made with HMRC. Your point is they should go further than they are, it, than they do. Point, yes. But turning then to, to the point of, uh, I can tie all these threads together. Given that the question at stake according to the review, according to the Secretary's skeleton argument, is has HMRC been misled by a migrant in their tax returns? That, as I've already shown, is not a, a question which is best answered by 3222 in terms of a previous application showing falsity, or necessarily 3225, which is the best fit, because this is a, an area of expertise that does not normally fall under immigration control. And the point I make, my lords, is that this question is best answered by the revenue and clustering to the degree to extent that it will affect the 3225 consideration. Uh, I'm not suggesting it's going to be dispositive entirely, but it is certainly relevant at the very least to the question being asked, as which is, has HMRC been misled? The revenue asked would be best place to say yes or no. My learned friends already covered the, a great deal of the tactical authorities I was going to touch upon, so I, I won't repeat those submissions. But just on the OG case, before um, leaving this area, um, which is <coughs> in the third volume of the authority, tab 57. And then, friends, observe, this is a um, case from the court session. In terms of its, 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 its relevance, it does prove a card. And as my Lord and Justice Singh observed, there are, um, <coughs> there's an old phrasing in terms of the judicial headnotes in Khan that it talks about a, um, a significant difference being enough, as it were, to create the suspicion necessary to refute in the first instance. Now, the odd thing of the, of the OG decision is that paragraph 30 on page 160, Seven zero, um, where Lord Tyre, in his opinion, states that I'm looking towards the bottom of that page, towards the top, of, uh, top of the next. Declarations of different <coughs> events are insufficient to establish. <coughs> now, this is obviously in direct conflict with the judicial head note in Khan, which suggests otherwise. So there is a, as it were, an inconsistency between these two authorities, which will of course be resolved. Paragraph 30 also suggests that the Secretary of State should consider uh, whether the error is inadvertent or whether it's intentional. Now, that again points to a subjective mindset being part of the consideration process. Um, my Lord, um, the Secretary of State referred to the authority of Saman and Kayani. Uh, I have stated that I will refer to Kayani, but um, I wonder if my Lord, uh, I should leave that to the reply instead. Uh, I think probably. Uh, in, that, in that case, my Lord, uh, Turning briefly then to, uh, and my lords don't need to turn it, I think it's been seen already today. Um, the other authority that my lords I rely upon in my dissemination of the relevant tax jurisprudence is uh, that of IV versus Jenkins Casino. And the thought of that, my lords, as we've already seen, is that there is a two stage approach. The first, obviously, is the subjective mindset, um, then considered from an objective, from an objective bystander's perspective. And, the example um, given earlier in the day was perhaps the most instructive in that you can, for example, have a, um, the mindset of a person who, for example, is a terrorist and believes that what they do is in the best interests of their own personal beliefs, but necessarily uh, an objective 
mindset of a bystander on the street would be that that is quite uh, perverse and not so. So it is that sort of um, contrast that I say the I University Gentian Casino was looking for. It's not something more subtle than that. It, the answer will be fairly obvious when it looks at you in the face. Now, uh, turning then my thoughts to um, the second topic, uh, the third topic that I was going to talk about was the issues in my client's case of procedural fairness and the... Well, I don't know if you were... I, I don't, just so I can be clear... You told us that deal with the academic at this point, the interactions of Secretary of State with ATMRC, tame side, the penalties regime, and then paras 19.1 and K. We've dealt with the first four. Is this an extra point? Uh, it's part of the, the 19.1 and K. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, forgive me. Uh, no, no, it doesn't matter. I just wanted to make sure I knew where we were going. So, well, also, I, 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 it would be helpful to have the third volume of the um, consolidated appeal bond at hand in that I'm going to refer to various parts of my client's application. Uh, do you need to remind us what paragraphs 19, 1 and K are? Sorry, Robert. Do you want to tell us what paragraphs 19, 1 and K are? Paragraphs 19, paragraphs 19 1 and K, my lord, are the um, relevant paragraphs in the rules which discuss in tab... Uh, Just show us where they are. Which? On the tab 11 on page um, 224 to 225, one also can see the uh, assessment that can take place in an application for settlement uh, as points against migrants. Sorry, no, wait, 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 I'm confused. Para page 222 in our bundle starts with being part of 245D, which I don't think is relevant to anything. Our purposes. Then we skip to two, two, three. We've skipped three hundred pages on, or two hundred pages on in the rules. This is para nineteen of what? Paragraph nineteen of Appendix A of the Immigration Rules. So apologies, my lord. I think it should have a separate tab. It doesn't matter. No, I just want to. Okay. So two, two, three is where nineteen, uh, the paragraph nineteen of Appendix A commences. Overleaf on two, two, four and two, two, five. One can see uh, paragraphs 19i, j, and k, which are relevant to the Commission of Contracts to make. 19i sets out that the Secretary of State must be satisfied that the earnings in the application for settlement are from a genuine employment. Yes, the, we, we would refer to that without being taken to it this morning. Yep. Yes. Uh, paragraph j uh, demonstrates the factors that the Secretary of State may take into account. Yes, but you're not making a point about that. I'm not. Uh, paragraph 19k demonstrates that the Secretary of State may request additional information and evidence under K1. Yes. Under K2, they may request that the applicant attend an interview. Uh, and it's in this context that I make these submissions. Now. Yes, thank you. That's very helpful. Let me just, no, just make a note of that. So the essential point is there, the Secretary of State has a right to uh, request attendance and interview. Yes. Yes, thank it's you. It's quite, quite unique and it's unlike other areas of the points-based system in that at this stage, um, this is what may occur. Now, in terms of my client's position, yeah. uh, the history is set out in, at length in the Stanton argument, but to, to summarise for my lords, uh, my client's application uh, was made whilst he still had to leave to remain. It was refused, and it was at the point of refusal that the um, discrepant figures were brought to his attention. Yes. He was not previously aware of them. Yeah. Now, in the course of the... Um, that application, he was after that point given a questionnaire. Now, the questionnaire itself is not in the appeal bundle, but an example of what it might look like is at pages 250 to 253. So, what this is, I have to make note of this. After the first refusal, after the first refusal, given a questionnaire. He's given a questionnaire. Which looks like, though it isn't the actual one, 250. It's actually from Mr. Balajagari's paper. Yeah, okay. Let's just have a look at it then. It's relevant to, it's ready to hand. And question nine is the question which the Secretary... Well, let me just find it first. Where will we find it? 
Um, so it's page 215 to 253 of the first volume of the Consolidated Appeal Bible. Okay. Yes. And on page 252, my lord, that is the question which the Secretary of State relies upon as putting the applicant yes. on notice. Well, we were told about this by Mr. Um, uh, <coughs> Biggs without it actually being taken to. Yes. And, and the point I make by drawing my lord's attention to is that it's a fairly innocuous question. Yeah. Are you satisfied with your self assessment tax returns? Unless you knew there was something to be unsatisfied about. You'd always say well, yes. I'm slightly puzzled. Surely uh, the first refusal would have already told him that was a problem. Are you sure you've told us correctly that this form was only served on him after the first refusal? Oh, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, well, that's right. So that, this is, you're already making the same point as Mr. Biggs, that this, this, this question doesn't put you on notice. Uh, indeed, my lord. Yeah. Now, the, my client was obviously not interviewed under the power given under paragraph 19 UK. No. He made a further application after his first application settlement failed, and he included the following materials, which can be seen, uh, apologies, turning back to the third volume of the Consolidated Appeal Bundles, uh, for the remainder of these submissions. Third. Third I've only got two. Oh, you've only got two. They are two. Oh, forgive me. Second volume, then. Uh, I do apologize. Uh, the second volume at page 1689. So it's very. You must forgive me, Mr. Saini, because it's um, difficult to keep the facts of these different cases in mind at this stage. Uh, had I got it wrong, was it not your client who. Um, uh, brought judicial review proceedings. He did. I'm coming to that. Oh, I see. He Sorry. Did. So. I, I, I'm just no, no, no. That's fine. I, 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 I. Obviously, great getting ahead of myself. Right. So he was. Um, so he submitted a second application, and you will see the covering letter at page one six eight nine. So this is before the judicial review. This is before the judicial review. Yeah. Yes, okay. And it is this covering letter from 1689 to 1694, and along with the materials running from 1737 through to 1787 that were submitted in the second application when he became aware of the error. To summarize, I, I, I won't, given the brevity of time, I won't turn my lord to the particular pages, but 1737, uh, is a letter from the accountant who uh, amended his tax return, and they have... So 1737. Yes, so that is a letter which um, they were sent with his application, and which is a letter addressed to HMRC, in which they say in the penultimate paragraph, we believe the error in relation to the overstatement that was careless and unprompted, and the applicant had filed a new return when he became aware of the error. Car they don't say they don't say careless and unprompted by who? Do they say it's their error? No, they're not saying it's their error. No, no not, not at all. The the applicant was a uh, filled in the tax return as a lay person. The first one was to be yes, Okay, yeah. So, um, there is, this is not a case in which um, there is uh, any blame laid at an accountant's door. It's simply um, how okay. the applicant as a lay person, foreign national, has interpreted the tax return form and filled in the expenses section. That's really it. And what these pages following 1737 onwards show is that, firstly, there's a letter in which the accountants have opined that he, his, his mistake was careless. They have also said, uh, shown afterwards on 1743 that the tax liability had been paid. At 17 or five, there was a table of the precise tax, uh, the precise expenses that were claimed by the applicant 
which has led to the difference in the figures. And it's our, it is... So we're at 1745. 1745. And one can see they're fairly mundane items, such as rent, car insurance, a professional qualification, petrol, travel costs, and things which, uh, as, as I'll point to in terms of the decision set, are simply not mentioned on the face of that letter at all. There's no consideration or grappling with whether a foreign national interpreting a tax return form in cell without professional assistance would think that these were allowable expenses as opposed to disallowable or unallowable expenses. Um, so that's the table of, of what he claims. He's also gone to the extent, then, overly, um, now this doesn't have a page number to it, but pull out a three spreadsheet, which he compiled and sent, whereby he has itemized every single expense in his bank account, which made him believe it was an expense. So it's not from thin air that he's plucked these figures. He's actually done some homework and gone through the bank statements and thought, well, this is petrol, etc. Um, he's then thereafter, at page 1747, put in his bank statements corresponding with the same tax year, which show um, the figures he's mentioned in the spreadsheet. Now, I'm not going to repeat the exercise later, but uh, this was before the Secretary of State, since the, before the Judicial Review um, claim, the first, the previous one, and has, of course, been before us since since then. So, in the first judicial review claim, up tribunal Judge Martin reached a decision, which one can see at uh, 1667 of the bundle, <coughs> on the Secretary of State's previous refusal, where uh, paragraphs 2 and 3 of page 1667 are, are fairly important. I, if I may, I'll pause from my memories to read those paragraphs. So sorry, I was just making a note. Uh, which pages? Uh, page 1667 is the decision um, granting permission on the papers by Judge Martin. Yes, uh, what particular paragraphs did you want us to Paragraphs read? two and three. Right? There must be an intervening decision. There, is a, there was a previous application whereby he was put on notice of the error. He reapplied and was refused again. Yeah, sorry. What's the date of that decision? The decision of the re-refusal. I'll just turn my back to the page. Oh, it was 25th of April, 2016. That's the same paragraph one. Uh, so it is. Yes. <laughs> my Lord's quicker than that. Just, just, give me, just, give me, just give me a moment. Just give me a moment. Yes, I see. So the Secretary of State was given all this material you were taking us through before, a few days before the decision, and made the decision very quickly. Yes, sir. Okay. So the, U the UT gives permission, as we see at 1667. Uh, and the reason I call attention to the the grant of permission is because it says that the reasons are um, she's relied too heavily on her earlier decision and has not given proper scrutiny to the document's submission. Now, this is the reason I pointed this is because this is somewhat unique to this judicial Yes, quite. No, it's that. a special case. Um, this was then subject of a consent order whereby the previous judicial review was settled, and in the course of settling the judicial review, my client then sent in um, his SA 302s, but more importantly, his tax year overviews, which are at page 1796 to 1804. Again, sorry, page references again? Uh, 1796 to 1804 are the uh, tax year overviews. So he submitted those as well as the SA 302s, but the importance of the tax year overview is that one can see from page uh, 275, sorry, um, 1799 and 1801 which are the relevant tax years in question, that in his amended tax returns, no penalties have been charged, hence 0, 0, 0 against the penalty column. So, my lords, this was 
relevant information before the Secretary of State at the time of the current decision, which is given rise to this appeal. So now we're in the context of this, uh, this litigation itself. Uh, is there a covering letter making those points? Uh, forgive me, there is not, because it was submitted, uh, my instructions are to submit to the GLD uh, after the consent order or around the time it was signed. Wait, but normally what you would expect to happen is consent order, Secretary of State says, all right, I'll look at it again. I haven't seen the order. The order would normally say, and any further representations. But even if there weren't any further representations, any, sorry, even if there was no provision for any further representations, you clearly put in further material. And one would expect some sort of covering letter saying, uh, pursuant to the, now we've settled and you've agreed to look at it again, here are the points we'd like you to take into account. Uh, is there nothing like that? The consent order is at page 166. Um, it's just the... Uh, uh, Opposing page to the grant of permission from Judge Martin. Yes. Okay, so the, the undertaking is to agree to reconsider. reconsider. All right, but well, it doesn't matter. That there's no express provision for further. The point is that your client did put in some further material, as one would have expected. Or, and, it's and, and my art question is wasn't there a covering letter saying, here's this further material, these are the points I make on it? There was simply an email, my lord. To, um, well, have we got the email? Uh, I no, all right, okay. I, my Lord, I can provide it. Um, Very well. I, I did see it last night. Apologies, it's not within the bundle. Um, my Lord, the point I'm coming to is um, all of this material, uh, what became of it in, in, the, in the decisions that are subject to this appeal, is what's important then. So th this is why I'm setting out an apology. Yes, no, 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 it's got to be done. Yep. Where are we going now then? So the decision in question uh, which arose from this was at page 1592 <coughs> to 1598. <coughs> And the, the core of the decision, or the, where the reasoning begins, can be seen on page 1595, um, near the second hole punch. It continues to the top of the next page. And as one can see from just glancing at those paragraphs, that there's an acknowledgement of the amended return being put in. Um, so where are, we, which, where, where are we looking at? Uh, I'm looking at uh, the third last paragraph. You state you On which page? On which page? On page 1595. Yep, okay. Uh, from there to the end of the letter is the purported consideration of the old material and all the new material. And if you look, if you look at the final paragraph, it says, consideration be given to the explanation provided. Uh, where was that explanation? Yeah, was that in the email we haven't got? It's in the covering letter um, from the solicitors, as well as, um, give me one moment. I'll well, would it, uh, why, one place it might be is in the judicial review claim form. All the evidence submitted with the judicial review. I'm told by the um, by my solicitor and the uh, appellant himself that it was in the judicial claim form. And Have we got that? My lord, yes, it's in, it's in the bundle. Where? Well, forgive me, I'll, I'll just get. The I'm sorry if I'm being over laborious, but, but I, it, it, if we're going. It's quite all right, my lord. I'll, I'll get the paper up to you. If I may, can I continue in the interim? Sorry. Internal, I think so. My Lord suggests that the judicial review claim form... Well, the, yes, detail, I, <laughs> the detailed grounds are on page 1630. Those are the, and the, I think the claim form is important. Yes, so it's quite... I mean, I, in fact, I now see, I did actually look at this last night. Uh, yes, there is. Um, I'm uh, very sorry. Yes, and indeed, on the bottom left-hand side, uh, or bottom of page 1632, one can see the list of um, allowable expenses in detail are, are copied there. And there is also, in fact, an email at 
Oh, that's the pre-action protocol. Forget that. But I suppose the pre-action protocol, we must assume, contain much the same material. Yes. 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 Okay, well, there's no need for us to, to look at that now, but that's been very helpful. We can know where to find it. Yes, so wh 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 where, what were you trying to get to? Well, what I was trying to get to is that there is no assessment therein of, firstly, and quite importantly, the subjective mind state of the lay applicant or taxpayer filling in this self-assessment form. Um, I, don't, I, I do seek to stress the point, but I, I, I don't believe I could overstress it, that he's a foreign national, this is an alien tax system. He is filling it in himself, and these are the answers he's giving to expenses. How long have you been in the country? Um, at that point in time, I believe, um, at the point in time of filling the, the form, uh, four years at that time. And running a business during that time? Um, The point is no assessment of subjective mind state mind or state. the particular information that was submitted, which was in some detail, particularly the spreadsheet which set out all of the expenses that are traceable. As I say, these aren't given to us from the air. Mr. Saini, I may have missed it, and I'd like your help on this, please. At, at 1595, and going over the page to 1596, yes, does the Secretary of State decision letter ever actually say that he concluded that the uh, your client had been deceitful or dishonest? No, no, of course not. It simply says as it does at the top. You say of, of course not, but it does in all the other letters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've seen a variety of letters. In this particular case, um, it's always been the case that that accusation has not been made. It's simply that the action of declaring a different amount of income led to the conclusion that it would be undesirable for him to remain here. This may or may not be significant in the end, but can we look, please, at the, the first paragraph on 1596? Because that seems to be, subject to what the Secretary of State submits later, the kernel of the reasoning. And some of it is similar to the reasoning we saw in the other case. And, and as my Lord has observed, what we saw in the other case is actually pretty much the same as what we see in the remaining two decision letters before us. But this one is slightly different because it doesn't make any reference to being deceitful or dishonest. But otherwise, the steps in the reasoning appear to be similar, concluding that a refusal under paragraph 3225 is justified. Yes, my lord. Uh, my lord will forgive me if I, if, I, if I didn't flag it up as something glaring the obvious. It's because of it. It is pro, temp, uh, pro forma template wording that I've seen in a multitude of, of such decisions. Uh, it, it might be that in, indeed it's unique that my co opponents have any suggestion of deception in their refusal letters. It certainly well, has look, but we can't, we, we but can't give evidence of what you've I, seen I, in I'm other not, letters. I'm not. But, uh, but I'm simply saying that uh, it didn't strike me as unusual in this cohort of cases. This, uh, this doesn't refer to deception or dishonesty. <coughs> it does, uh, the paragraph to which my Lord refers, does refer to um, the evidence not satisfactorily mm. demonstrating that the errors were genuine errors, whatever that means. Mm. And it does also yes. say that you had a motive to deceive. Yes. Uh, I didn't yes. use the word deceive, but had a motive to falsely represent your earnings. Yes. So clearly it would have been better if it had said, um, I therefore conclude that you were guilty of deception, but I think anyone reading... Uh, that paragraph as a whole would see that was what was being alleged in rather plotted well, language. Although, yes. if I may say so, with respect, that it's phrased in the alternative. Yes. Uh, it is noted that there would have been a clear benefit to you either or by falsely representing. Well, but that's the, 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 sorry, <laughs> I have a debate within the court, but that, there's a two alternative way. Yes. One is the, the alternative is either not to declare your full earnings. Well, yes. there are two ways one can read the sentence. One could read it in that the Secretary of State is trying to cover all bases and have her yes. easy by yes. saying you deceived us, you deceived them. One could say that she, uh, sorry, forgive me, he doesn't have a clue what the allegation really is. Um, well, it could be said the Secretary of State doesn't know. 
what if the Secretary of State's position is, I'm satisfied you deceived either the revenue or me. I can't tell which, but I don't need to tell which. It's e mm. equally um, uh, make you unde make it undesirable to have you in the country. Don't mind whether you've lied to the revenue or lied to me. And it's a, really a waste of resource to try and find out which. I know, yes, but then we come back to the ugly, ugly word of uh, anxious scrutiny being given to those two. Well, that's a separate point, but I'm just trying to identify um, the extent to which what is actually said is yeah. uh, objectionable. And I'm putting to you, and it, I, it's not the best draft of the paragraph, but certainly, but I'm putting to you that the paragraph as a whole does convey that the Secretary of State has formed the view that you lied either to the revenue or to him or her, as it then was, uh, and uh, either way that makes it undesirable for you to um, be given leave to remain. Well, Isn't that sufficiently clear? It does convey that message, yes, it, it does convey that. But that's putting it at its height, that's, that's all it really does convey. Um, it's the assessment, moreover, that is what is lacking here rather than the overall message um, in writing. And well, the final piece of the, um, this jigsaw is then the administrative review outcome, which is at page 1643 to 1648. And this is the maintenance of the previous decision we have just um, seen in detail. So the key passage which I have flagged up in the Thurston argument is on page 1644, and this is the second last paragraph. Um, and what the appellant takes most umbrage with is the fourth line from the end, or the penultimate sentence itself. I'm so sorry, again, I've just been making a note. Where, where, where's the, um, which One, page? 1644. Four. Four, four. Yep. Penultimate paragraph, penultimate sentence of that paragraph, or fourth line from the end of that penultimate paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, and the sentence that starts the SSHD agreed to reconsider the case, but as with any reconsideration, no new evidence is introduced. It is therefore entirely unsurprising that based on exactly the same evidence, another caseworker evaluating your case has arrived at the same conclusion. Uh, this is important because, as I've already highlighted, the tax year overviews in the SA 302 were submitted as part of the reconsideration. It's been said here in, in black and white that haven't been looked at, that is obviously uh, a flaw, therefore, in the evidence yeah. that's before us. I'd be wrong to say, notice <laughs> that the Secretary of State's confusing two different things. An administrative review, we've been shown, of this kind, he or she doesn't look at any fresh evidence, but the reconsideration, which was a, an ad hoc agreement to settle the JR proceedings, no reason whatever why they shouldn't introduce fresh evidence, and they did. Indeed. Yes. Um, I have, um, there is one item I have hand up, my Lord, which is the reconsideration of guidance, which gives the last uh, word on this matter. Um, forgive me, my Lord. <coughs> Within this guidance, my Lord, um, to put the submission in short, I know we're running short on time. Well, hang on, what, what, is, what is it you're handing? I'm handing out the Home Office reconsiderations. Have, have Mr. Malik and Ms. Anderson have checked it. I've to Mr. Yeah. Malik first this morning. I'll just take you straight to the relevant pages. Um, there are only two, mostly, in this uh, document. They are page 24 and 45, um, to give a, as complete a picture as possible. Now, page 24 is under the heading, Considering a Reconsideration. Well, what is, sorry, what sort of reconsideration is this? Well, well the, this guidance applies to all what are termed reconsiderations if one looks Yes, but I just don't know what it, they mean by reconsideration. It may well... I, 
it, it doesn't have some special meaning. Does it just mean any time you look again at a case? This is a reconsideration because of a tacit acceptance in judicial review that the first consideration wasn't adequate. The, the definition of a reconsideration is um, on page 6 of 47. Um, a reconsideration is a review by the Home Office of a decision made on an application for, uh, and it covers indefinitely for a reason. Turning from there. That's not a, de a, de a review. It doesn't say what kind of review. But it's simply the definition of what. Oh, well, I think. Oh, right. Okay, I, I. Well, let's not spend time on this. I'm not at the moment clear that this is this is this is quite what we're concerned with here. But let's assume it is. Yep. So, you, page twenty-four. What's the point? Uh, page 24, the point, my lord, is that under the heading of uh, considering a reconsideration evidence and information, it states in the, against the first two sets of bullet points, um, and second line down, when you reconsider a decision, you must only consider the evidence and information supplied, um, either the original application or, or the date of the decision, <coughs> unless it uh, proves the documents were genuine, as it says in the third bullet point, or impacts upon the decision outcome, which is an interesting So this is very similar to the uh, rules applying to administrative review? Is, yes. Right, okay. But the point is, is that um, this isn't a, an immigration rule, this is simply a piece of guidance. Yes, okay. And, and what's, the other, what's the other paragraph, uh, the other page? The other paragraph is paragraph page 45, the second <coughs> sentence into that page, which is specifically, <coughs> specifically concerns judicial review claims. And it states, when you reconsider a decision, you must thoroughly consider all the points raised by the applicant or representative. So there's something of a, an inconsistency between these two approaches. Yeah, well, the term reconsideration covers a multitude of different situations. So where does this get you? Well, this gets me to the point, my lord, that the applicant, uh, the appellant has submitted evidence in terms of this, um, reconsideration exercise, if I can term it that. The Secretary of State has, through her self-directed guidance, bettered the discretion that can be applied in terms of the evidence available. Is this point pleaded in that? Uh, my Lord, it's pleaded to the extent that I have criticised the reconsideration wording in that it's been No, right, but this, this, <coughs> this point... Uh, this, this document, it sounds to me as though you've only found today or yesterday. It, yes, my Lord, indeed. I see. Okay, so there's a new point, but your point is... Well, my get the substance of it without even looking at that document. But your point is that um, there's a policy that fetters the discretion. Okay. Right, now, those who have watches tell me that it is after 4.15. Um, are those all the points that you wish to make? Uh, my Lord, the essential remaining point is, one is the, the good character requirement guidance that the Secretary of State has drafted, and the second is... H how are these... <coughs> okay, let's tell what the points are. That's the first one. Sorry, my Lord, I couldn't... That's the first one. Good character guidance. Yeah. What's the next the point? The second point is the, um, the application then of 19i to my client's certificate. And how long will it take you to develop those points? I would have thought, my Lord, 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Well, my Lord, we're turning the pages uh, quite slowly. 10 minutes, my Lord, at the most. And that, that will be the, the end of your submission. It is, yes. What else have we still got to hear? Uh, um, we presume you've got to hear... Uh, Mr. Karim, do I understand that you're only making points relevant to your client's case, unlike Mr. Mr. Saini made some points of general application about Tameside and so on? Indeed, my Lord. So you will presumably be very short? I should be, approximately 15 to 20 minutes. Mr. Slatter? Yes, yeah, so I would estimate the same. Uh, how are you dividing matters, Ms. Anderson and Mr. Malik? Um, to some extent, we need to hear um, what else is coming, as it were, but Provisionally, as matters stand, I'm going to deal with the general points. Um, my learned friend, Mr. Malik, is particularly going to respond to Mr. Saini's submissions because obviously yes. he's engaged in that, that particular issue. Just give me one moment. Very well, Mr. Saini. Um, well, you finish your submissions. Um, uh, I. Uh, 
I'm sorry if I sounded um, surprised. If they take 15 minutes, they'll take 15 minutes, but I don't think they should, from uh -huh. what I understand them to be. Yeah. That is a very a sincere. Um, I, my Lord, the point of all these um, considerations of the refusal letter was, as you'll see from my written skeleton of them, I'm not going to repeat its omissions. I simply made the point that the refusal letter didn't um, genuinely engage with the application itself in the reconsideration. There's no genuine exercise of discretion here where the case workers have obviously closed their mind because they think the evidence is exactly the same. Yeah, we've got, I've got that point. Yeah. Turning then, my Lord, to Annex D. Annex D is the good character evidence which the Secretary of State has drafted, uh, and that can be found in the tab 84, um, page 2239. Sorry, which bundle are we in? Um, volume 3 of the authority is tab 84. <laughs> yes. My Lords, as one will see from the title, it is Annex D to Chapter 18, the Good Character Requirement. The relevant section is on page 2341 in Overleaf. And the section is entitled Deceitful or Dishonest Dealings with Her Majesty's Government. The reason I've pointed to this is because it's the only published guidance from the Home Office in terms of where another Department of Government has been uh, deceived. So it is fairly relevant. Now, what I should say um, uh, as a caveat is that the Secretary of State's case is that good character should be um, identical across the board, whether it's settlement or citizenship. This guidance, um, ironically, applies to citizenship as opposed to settlement. But as we'll see in a moment, the threshold is less than that that may be implied in these cases. So, again, there is a dis restricted section, and I don't know what it said, but in the, on page 2341, the penultimate sentence that starts the decision maker um, is what I write my lords to read first. Dan, just Dan, how, how much do you want us to read? Uh, just 2341, uh, the first the sentence before examples might include. Okay, done that. So obviously there has to be clear dishonesty. Looking overly after the examples of defrauding another government body, um, which of course are said to not be exhausted. The last two sentences above 8.3 are what is the most relevant. So the decision maker will in these applications assess uh, false information provided, what was gained or intended. So intent is important. And finally, the decision maker will not normally refuse because the person has made a genuine mistake here on application form, or importantly, because they claim something to which they reasonably believe or were advised they were entitled. And the point I make here is that, again, we are looking at the subjective mindset of an applicant as to whether they have a reasonable belief they were entitled to claim something that they did, as opposed to this being genuine deception of another government department. And I mention this because, of course, in my client's case, he genuinely believed he was filling in the income tax form correctly. Others might say that they were genuinely advised by the accountant that the tax returns were correct. But it is of broad application. And all, forgive me for being uh, hurried, but that takes me to the final point, which is uh, the assessment of paragraph 19i in my um, client's case. <coughs> it's stated that paragraph, um, and I'm going to refer to in the course of these submissions to the skeleton argument of the Secretary of State and also um, to the relevant decision page in my client's decision letter. Um, so firstly it is paragraph 99 of the Secretary of State skeleton argument, which I can read if my lords don't have it to hand. Well, I'm sure we can find it. For myself, I have it. Um, well, also, this is the, um, the, the, the paragraph itself makes clear that the Secretary of State will reward no point and will refuse if an, app, uh, an application that he is not satisfied as being a genuine applicant claimed earnings. Now, in my client's case, 
Uh, one can see it is inconsistent with that in page 1596 of uh, the Bible, which is the relevant page of his decision letter. Which is the page that um, the Lord of Justice Singh was um, referring to earlier in the panel of the top of that page. One can see from this um, page, and approximately halfway down the page, there is a paragraph that starts, your application for indefinite leave to remain has also been considered under paragraph 245CD. Moving down to the third miniature paragraph below that, in your settlement application you claim points of various things, please of course um, 25 points for your earnings. It then states, the points claimed for your blank blank earnings have been accepted. So the point is, is that um, my client's case was um, his earnings were accepted, but he has been refused nonetheless. And as one can see in any event, looking through the, um, the most recent earnings, which is what 99 refers to, uh, there has been no criticism of his employment. Um, in well, uh, hang on. If I agree it's not very... It, these are not perfect letters, but... It's, there's no necessary inconsistency there. If the position is the earnings you've now declared, we accept are true, but we're applying 3225 because you lied to the revenue in the past, that's perfectly consistent, isn't it? Uh, not, uh, only if it were, say, for example, the same source or income stream. So, for example, if you, if you ran a business in the past and it is said that you weren't genuinely running that business and you're still running the same business, it would make sense that the previous earnings that were doubted as being genuine are still doubted now for those antiquated or vintage reasons. However, where, as it was my client's case, he was previously self-employed, but now he's simply employed by an IT company. There's nothing said as to why his employment, as opposed to self-employment, for the IT company isn't genuine. So that is the, uh, the paradox in this refusal letter. There's no criticism or malignment of his employment as opposed to his self-employment. So it's an entirely inconsistent uh, stance to take in refusal in paragraph 99. And I believe, I want to check before I may say this, Submissions. I'm grateful for no, thank you, Mr. Cheney. Um, that's been helpful. Um, I'm sure Ms. Knight, you're going to be um, uh, bending the ears of those who may be speaking tomorrow to so give uh, you some time. Or perhaps you think it's all so wonderful that you've had uh, nothing have to add. I do have some submissions I'd like to make very briefly to her. What I did do, I hope it reached the my lord, is to uh, produce the note and reply to the Secretary of State for Delegate Arts. That hasn't reached my lord, but I'd like to read it overnight. Uh, no, because you haven't been given permission to intervene ah. at the moment. But, we could well, read on a dead burning essay thing. I suppose I could. Have you, have you had permission? No. Well, we better, let's have it in case. We will, might no. look at it in the essay. I have it here. Ah. These were all sitting on the bench this morning. And I ah, well, in that case, I have got it, but I certainly haven't read it. But I will... Um, and there's a, there's all, any no, no, authorities referred the to therein are copies here. Right. I can, I'm happy to hand those up or not. Well, uh, speaking for myself, uh, it's not particularly helpful if I say so to have just a list. No, no, I have uh, been cautious. They're already, they were already um, uh, subject to my lord's views. Oh, if you've got them, yes, we could have them now, certainly. Uh, there is a point I need to uh, elaborate upon, which is the impact of how on the cases I refer to. It's about the statutory scheme, which was concerning. Well, my let, let's not let's not hear hear hear, yeah. hear submissions now, um, and uh, we'll see how we go tomorrow. Thank you very much. So we'll say. Um, Let's just have these before we learn rise. Half past ten.